we can go live yeah good on are we ready live varun can i start we are live yes yes okay. good afternoon i am uh, desh gaurav sekri from niti ayog and i would like to thank everyone for uh, taking the time out on a saturday afternoon to join us uh, here today today we are focusing on a on a session where the role of industry in using online dispute resolution to help the ease of doing business from a justice delivery perspective uh, will be discussed we have uh, several extremely eminent speakers beginning with justice shri krishna we are honored to have with us and will make his keynote address shortly we will then have a panel uh, which will feature the heads of the top law firms as well as general counsels from some of the most respected corporate presences in india next we will have a walk through the emerging odr startup landscape which will lead into an exciting panel for understanding industry applications for odr we then have an opportunity to hear from mr manish sabarwal who will talk about the adoption of technology and upskilling this session will be followed by a short conversation on the road ahead for odr which will segue into an address by mr deep kalra and mr sanjay mohan from make my trip on adoption of technology in the post pandemic world for online dispute resolution we will then benefit from a valedictory address by mr sanjeev bajaj vice president of cii so as you can see we have an extremely pertinent and topical convening planned here today and i would like to ask uh, mr amitabh khan ceo niti ayog to give us his welcome address so uh good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh i am truly delighted to welcome all of you to this extremely topical timely and widely important discussion on unlocking the potential of odr for industry especially from the perspective of ease of doing business and ease of access to justice online dispute resolution is a fast evolving dispute resolution mechanism that uses technology not just to aid but to proactively assist efficient and affordable justice delivery it can be used as a mechanism for solving disputes outside of the formal court system in an affordable and quick way especially for small and medium value matters i must start by thanking the honorable justice uh, shri krishna for accepting our invitation to speak at this convening justice shri krishna is one of the most respected jurists that our nation has known and his reputation and brilliance speak for themselves we are indeed fortunate to have him here with us ladies and gentlemen the covid 19 pandemic has altered how we function and while it is a challenge that we must all combat together it is equally important that we use any opportunity available to help alleviate the challenges faced by those most vulnerable to its overarching impact one of the most encouraging developments recently is just how progressive and in fact innovative the supreme court of india has been in adopting technology chief justice s a bobde has on a few occasions mentioned the potential benefits of artificial intelligence in non decision making technology adoption to make courts more efficient justice d y chandrachud who leads the e court initiative has initiated critical changes that are already noticeable the introducing of e filing from anywhere in india making it available 24 into 7 is nothing short of a game changer as is the extensive work being done on digital courts and other tools to aid and facilitate technology indian courts today are leading the way in adapting and adopting leading practices in a extremely sustainable and forward thinking manner i have great hope that we are witnessing a visionary period in the history of india's court system on 6 june niti ayog had held a closed door meeting on odr where justice chandrachud justice sanjay kaul justice indu malhotra 
and retired Justice A.K. Sikri spoke positively of ODR's potential. We also greatly benefited from the contribution of Mr. Nandan Nilatani, Mr. Colin Rule, and the representatives from the legal fraternity, the government, and from industry during the meeting. Through a combination of several factors, we are at the cusp of transformative changes. And with alterations necessitated by the pandemic, technology will play a key role in widening equity and affordability. The pandemic has actually forced a shift towards solutions that minimize contact and can be activated through technology, including the resolution of disputes. The unfortunate circumstances have iterated the crucial role of technology in allowing remote contactless support to daily work roles, flagging its importance to a flat and affordable form of access to justice. In today's age of data-driven solutions and machine learning, ODR is more than just replicating existing processes of ADR online. This is simply because technology can aid the resolution of disputes by providing analytical insights for the benefit of dispute resolution. Even before the COVID crisis, there was a growing recognition of the fact that in a country as large and as fast growing as ours, it was essential to resolve a large number of disputes collaboratively outside of courts to sustain trust between the parties. So while we digitize our courts and make them far more efficient, we will still need collaborative mechanisms of resolution that do not require parties to approach courts. Most small and medium value disputes could potentially be resolved without approaching courts, allowing courts to focus on far more complex cases or that, or that of high public interest. A collaborative mechanism of ODR provides this potential to resolve a substantial percentage of disputes at the site of their occurrence without burdening the courts. Progressive and disruptive changes in justice delivery are crucial components now that can alter the course of access to justice in an unprecedented way. Each arm of the Indian system must and is working towards a solution-driven future, and that is where change will be visible. It is highly likely that there will be a deluge of disputes in the courts most notably in lending, credit, property, commerce, and retail. And this is inevitable in the coming months that will require expedient resolution. That is why new innovation models such as online dispute resolution need explicit support. Support now would encourage businesses to build ODR mechanisms into their partner and customer relationships. Banks, NBFCs, and MFIs could then prioritize ODR before they approach debt recovery tribunals. Families would take recourse to ODR to address sensitive issues and so on. Hence, with ODR, a mechanism of justice would be made accessible, affordable, and easily available for citizens. A robust ODR ecosystem in India will have high potential to reduce the load on courts by resolving high volume of disputes outside the court. Facilitating access to justice and ease of doing business by making dispute resolution cheaper, quicker, and most importantly, equally credible as conventional methods of dispute resolution. Increasing trust in businesses and also within society by prioritizing collaborative resolution. It is vital that key stakeholders come together to see what steps can be taken to remove the barriers to scalable ODR. The result would be a range of creative, technology-driven, and ADR-inspired solutions that could significantly reduce the load on our courts. We are fortunate today to have some of the top legal minds and industry representation from both traditional and new age industry. We have the honor of having Justice Sri Krishna with us. We have Mr. Shroff, and we have also delighted to welcome Mr. Manish Shabarwal and Mr. Deep Kalra at today's meeting. We will also be delighted to welcome Mr. Sanjeev Bajaj, the Vice President CII, who's who will be uh, giving us a pers his perspective. 
Thank you also to the teams from Agami and Omedia Network India with whom this is the second meeting in a series of such discussions. I'm extremely hopeful that today's meeting accelerates the continuation of the collaborative exercise that began on June 6th and sets the foundation for all that we plan to do for the ODR in coming months. We will be working closely on ODR in the coming months and working with the key stakeholders to help enable it as a viable and sustainable form of dispute avoidance and dispute resolution. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Now, without further ado, I would like to request Justice Sri Krishna, former judge, Supreme Court of India, for his keynote on the emergence of online dispute resolution in India. Sir. Of Niti Ayog and all the dear friends, visible and invisible on this platform. I think it, if you take a look at the UNESCO's constitution, there is a very interesting saying there. It says, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Friends, this is true equally of a dispute. Dispute really begins in the minds of men. And that is where you must deconstruct it and bring out a con conciliatory approach. ODR naturally is a substitution. Or not only is it a substitution for the normal adjudicatory dispute mechanism, but it is also a preventive mechanism. ODR consists of several limbs. One would be mediation, the next step would be conciliation, then there could be arbitration, and then finally, of course, if nothing works, the courts are always there to do the adjudication that is necessary as they have been empowered under the Constitution. Now, what is it that prevents us from doing ODR generally? ODR somehow has not taken off so far. Uh, thanks to pandemic, we are doing a lot of things which we are not doing earlier. Apart from that, some attempts have been made to uh, generate the velocity for ODR even in our country much before the pandemic struck us. But somehow it didn't take off for various reasons. Some of the reasons are, first and foremost, what is it that is necessary? The necessary mindset. The mindset that you don't have to rush to the court to solve a dispute. And there is it, and the resolution of the dispute can be done with equal efficacy by resorting to another mechanism is something that needs to sink into the minds of people who are concerned with disputes. Now, even after the pandemic, even after some of attempt has been made by some of the uh, social social organizations like Agami and others to resort to ODR, people have come to me and asked me questions and said, hey, but is this legal? Is it permissible under the Arbitration Act? Is it permissible under some other law? To my mind, these questions are absolutely irrelevant. Nothing is there in any, any of the laws which says that you can't solve the problem by any method that is permissible under law, which is not prohibited by law. Now, you don't have to, you don't need to have an amendment to the Arbitration Act to say that yes, you can do it on an electronic platform. If you can do it face to face, certainly you can do it remotely on a digital platform also. So the mindset is something that needs to be looked at for the first time that you must make hold such a public debates and let the idea percolate into the minds of people that, hey, this is an option that is available to us, which can really work equally well. Now, the next question is development of technology to meet the challenges. Now, what is it that you need in technology? You need an efficient digital platform on which people can exchange their ideas and come out with a solution to the problem even before the problem becomes an aggravating factor. Now, that is a challenging task, undoubtedly, because these platforms may be of different varieties technologically, and how far it is possible to evolve them 
is an attempt that is being done by some of our very competent technological, technologically advanced uh, companies and businesses. And I'm sure that surely we'll solve this problem to the best of our ability. Now it's uh, surprising that our boys and girls can go abroad and teach others how to fly rockets into the moon, but this is surely something very elementary for them. Now the next question is, now we, are we therefore going to say that courts did not exist. Courts can exist, courts can cannot carry on with their business, which they are, they are required to do under the constitution. And this can act as a complement to the court system. In fact, it will act as an auxiliary of the court system in the sense that it will prevent a large number of litigations unnecessarily being flooded into the courts. This will help in two, three ways. A, it will help in the courts time being allowed to deal with larger, important, and seminal issues. It will also help in clearing the backlog that we have suffered. Our lawyers and judges are equal to, or probably even better than some other that I have made abroad. But what we bogged down our system is the backlog. Now, this can be a good way of diverting the floods into another channel so that the courts are allowed to have free play in their calendars. I think that's a great achievement that we have done. Now, as I said, the mindset, the mindset also has this, before the dispute germinates and starts uh, taking growth, it is better to eliminate them by resort to the other ODR options like mediation and conciliation. And then of course, as arbitration as an alternative to the litigative system. Now, these attempts are being made were being made actually even before the pandemic hit us. But thanks to, uh, I think it was William Shakespeare who said that sweet are the uses of adversity. And this is an opportunity when we can demonstrate the truth of what the Bard of Ebon said, that the adversity has given an opportunity of proving that we can take the adversity for turn it to our own benefit and improve the system in a manner that will be conducive to solving this problem that has been faced us in the court corridors. Then we have one difficulty that we have faced technologically. In fact, I have done a lot of work uh, uh, since the pandemic hit us. I've been doing a lot of work on these kind of platforms using different softwares. The inability, the inability to maintain connectivity of the internet this is a problem that uh, some of the, at the level of the government, some solution will have to be found out. Now, I find that when I'm talking to you, halfway through it will either, the audio will freeze or the video will freeze. Now, this is not a big issue if technologically it is handled. I'm sure our technology is capable of it. Our people who are at the helm will be able to solve this problem easily so that this kind of a dialogue can be carried out, whether inside the court or outside the court on an electronic platform without interruption of uh, technological uh, difficulties. Now, some of this I'm told, I was in fact a very, in fact, at the very initial stage, uh, Mr. Uh, Amitabh Khan talk of the closed door meeting of where the line two judges of the Supreme Court were available. Uh, there was a kind of a, a brainstorming which was done where I was a part of it. We produced a report and with a forward of it, he passed it on to the Supreme Court, both the Chief Justice and Justice Chandrachur. They very much appreciated. They took it up from there, and they are seriously working on that. And it, it gives a lot of encouragement to the people who are otherwise also concerned with this, uh, like Agami and others, who are doing uh, this kind of work in the public space. Now, one of the solutions that has been found out is when you are dealing with a situation like uh, I'm told that this has been tried in the Rajasthan uh, state, that even Lok Adalat matters are disposed of electronically on an electronic platform. And if there is an interruption uh, as a result of the failure of the internet or the speed of the internet dropping, they use what is known as the asynchronous voice method. They'll also simultaneously talk on the telephone and solve it. Now, to some extent it may be possible, but in a serious, you can't try it an issue in the Supreme Court by this kind of method. You have to have continuous streaming 
continuous uh, availability of voice and video if you have to seriously solve the problem. Finally, I would say that this is an encouraging thing. This helps us in the courts being uh, subjected to less pressure, which means two things. A, the biggest headache that we have had in the litigation system of backlog, they can slowly be handled and cut down to size. Number two, everybody was talking from the day I joined the bar of taking the justice to the doorstep of the litigant. Now this can really help you in doing that. If the litigant need not come from Kerala to Delhi, he can solve it on an electronic platform, either in dialogue with the court or in dialogue with some kind of ODR mechanism, which will solve the problem. Justice at last would have been delivered to his doorsteps. And that way, if you apply the, the, the learning that we have done uh, in so many days, during and prior to the pandemic hitting us, we should be able to tackle the problem on all fronts. And I'm sure with the kind of uh, experts that you have gathered around you, both in the matters of technology and in being leaders of the industry and best the legal brains that you have, we should be able to solve this problem efficiently for the satisfaction of all of us and for achieving greatness in the country. Thank you very much. My best wishes to you for this conference. May this produce some concrete solutions which will be capable of being applied forthwith and may that produce better and better results as we go along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, Justice Sri Krishna. Thank you for your very positive, thought-provoking encouragement for online dispute resolution. We greatly appreciate it. We in Niti Aayog have constituted a committee led by Justice Sikri with several leading people. And I think we'll come up with a very clear, precise recommendation within a month. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this occasion. We deeply uh, and greatly appreciate your joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kant, and thank you, uh, Justice Shri Krishna. I'd just like to uh, make a quick announcement that Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee, uh, Director General of CII, is unable to attend Good. our session because of a last minute, uh, last minute conflict. So we'll go ahead with our next panel. So I'd like to introduce Rahul Mathan, who will be moderating this session. Uh, Rahul is a partner at Trilegal, and he has headed some of the largest TMT transactions in India. He will be moderating the panel on ODR in India, opportunities and challenges. Uh, we, will have, we will have representation from several of the leading lawyers and general counsels. Please, Rahul. Desh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, for the second time. Uh, this uh, panel is uh, even more stellar than the last one, and I thought the last one was stellar. Uh, we've got general counsels uh, of the, you know, the top businesses in the country, and we have uh, the uh, management of the top firms uh, in this country. And so, uh, actually, I should just get out of the way and uh, get straight into it. Uh, these are people who need no introduction. Uh, but the first person who I'd like to call on uh, is Pramod Rao. Uh, Pramod is general counsel of ICICI Bank. And uh, Pramod, uh, in many ways, is, is the correct person to kick this off, given that he uh, has had uh, some considerable experience uh, with ODR in the most recent times, uh, and also is uh, leading a bank which has uh, some significant commitment to digital uh, initiatives. Uh, so, Pramod, if you would uh, kick us off uh, in this in this session with uh, your views on, you know, what the opportunities are uh, for ODR, particularly since uh, you uh, were invested in the and the bank was invested in this long before you were forced to be because uh, of the of the pandemic. Pramod, thank you, thank you, Rahul. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank Niti Aayog, uh, Agami, Omidyar Network, and of course CII for uh, hosting, uh, you know, what is indeed an important issue for the country at this moment. Uh, to me, uh, you know, there are several barriers to doing business that we have been aware of for a long time. And timely enforcement of contracts is amongst those items or reasons uh, that we end up scoring low on uh, uh, ease of doing business as a country. Reasons are not too far to see, and I think uh, Justice Shri Krishna alluded to them, uh, as did Mr. Khan. We have an overburdened uh, judiciary, we have an understaffed judiciary, 
and we have poor judicial infrastructure. And all these were true before the COVID-19 pandemic, which has only exasperated this problem. We, of course, have to acknowledge all of the you know, uh, manner in which the Supreme Court and the High Courts have risen to the challenges as also some of the tribunals, uh, which have utilized technology. And I think that can indeed be also called ODR. I wanted to talk about actually three other types of ODR. Uh, and probably building on uh, what Mr. Khan said and what uh, Justice Shri Krishna said, that this is about what can happen outside the court. Uh, and uh, to me, the first part of uh, you know what the courts have done is indeed going online. But as I said, I want to talk about three different uh, uh, things that we have been actively uh, both uh, exploring and pioneering uh, uh, as a bank. Uh, the first is ODR, which encompasses arbitration, mediation, conciliation which is administered by an independent institution, which selects and appoints the neutrals. For us, the independent institution ensures that the platform is secure and user-friendly, neutrals are qualified, and the matters are managed to ensure timely outcomes. In our own experience, for the matters that we have referred, we have had decisions which have, or the outcomes which have come through in 120 days at a maximum, and a minimum uh, which has been in few hours. Uh, to us, these are all resolutions with active engagements of our counterparties, primarily retail customers. Uh, our own target uh, for the institution is reaching these uh, outcomes in 45 days or less. Uh, we also favor outcomes which arise from mediation and conciliation as it reflects a joint intent to resolve the issues. And we look at arbitration as necessary only to provide finality where mutual resolution can't uh, be arrived at or matters themselves are open and shut. Uh, while our journey has begun in personal loans, uh, our ambition is to extend it across all retail assets, retail liabilities, and for our MSME relationships. The second type of ODR, uh, which uh, is what takes in customer grievances and customer complaints, and which we envisage as doing an automatic check of our electronic records and database to determine whether the complaint is rightly made, genuine, and hence requires redress and goes forward to provide the actual redress. Uh, the recent, uh, uh, just a couple of days back, the RBI guidelines, which have been issued on digital payments, embedding ODR comes really from this perspective and again reflects what is possible. I'll take a short uh, example to share here. For instance, if a customer complains about an ATM dispensing short cash, uh, to us, if there can be an automated check of the ATM cash balances, check whether there is any excess cash or if the cash was dispensed. Similarly, if ATM camera records are available to us, we can actually make out did the person withdraw the full cash, was it left behind, was it short dispensed and uh, so on. It would allow a swift response to the complaint where minimum human intervention is required uh, to uh, you know, evaluate and respond to this. Uh, the third type of ODR is really the voluntary or mandatory reference to mediation that judicial forums can adopt. Uh, Justice Shri Krishna just touched upon it in terms of state of Rajasthan. I'm happy to report that actually it's not just state of Rajasthan, but also Delhi and West Bengal, which have embraced online local dialogue. And they are using platforms provided by these ODR institutions uh, to make sure that it can actually work at scale and indeed uh, decongest the courts as well. Uh, the results of this, I'm sure, will encourage other states, uh, uh, legal services authorities, and judicial forums to harness the platforms uh, 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 and the ODR mechanisms. So to me, these three, uh, taken in combination uh, uh, or uh, separately, really have a huge ability to enhance both the confidence of business community that contracts will be enforced in a timely and fair manner, but also for our customers and citizenry, that fair and trustworthy, transparent attendance of their grievance or issues will also occur. Uh, to echo the thinking at our bank, I think it is that it is fair to the customers and fair to the bank. And that makes relationships that will be long lasting and mutually beneficial. The ingredients that we need for all these three uh, ODR mechanisms are at hand. Uh, Justice Shri Krishna mentioned that, you know, we may not need a legal change. I would say we already have a supportive legal framework. We have the technology tools and bandwidth, which is increasing. And now an active set of ODR institutions, uh, which will have to, of course, continually add to the neutrals and keep the technology robust, secure and scalable, as well as inclusive.
Uh, to me, uh, I guess there are two cautions or two items uh, with which I will conclude. One is that we should not think of legislating or regulating this too early in the process. I think we have barely begun the journey. Uh, there will be both innovation and disruption that will occur. Uh, these need to be, uh, there will be learnings from that. There will be missteps, there will be mistakes. But I think only after we have observed it for a couple of years, should we really think of uh, uh, legislating or regulating it? Uh, the second is, uh, you know, we have to be alive to the issue of digital divide. Uh, again, to my mind, uh, you know, the engagement, we should not necessarily think of it as only being on video or chat. Uh, to me, uh, audio is as much a component of ODR. And even if our smartphone penetration is probably estimated to reach 500 million people, the feature phones or access to even internet points or uh, STD booths can actually allow for a coverage of, uh, you know, people uh, from the ODR mechanism point of view. I was searching for an analogy that I had shared with Rahul on how ODR can help. So almost 20 years ago, uh, we at the bank uh, created an automatic bill presentment uh, uh, solution for utility bills. Uh, and we're expanding it across different areas uh, in an enterprise called Bill Junction. Uh, when we approached the Thane Municipal Corporation, the commissioner then was so excited. And what he wanted was that all the taxpayers of the property tax actually utilize this mechanism. And he said, I will actively encourage that we actually get a discount if they come onto your platform and pay. And for us, you know, we were, of course, quite excited at that uh, response. But we asked him what was his thinking. And to him, it was that, well, the rest of my officers who otherwise focus on tax collection can focus on those who don't pay tax, right? Uh, and to me, that is really the challenge which will be there if ODR institutions succeed, that the courts and governments can focus on those who cannot access uh, these for any reason whatsoever. And of course, attend to the higher, uh, you know, important matters in a more uh, justiciable way. So I'll, I'll conclude here, uh, Rahul, and uh, thank you again uh, for the opportunity. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Pramod. That example actually is so evocative because in many ways it's the counterintuitive answer. Uh, and uh, actually the opportunity is not in serving the disputes that we have, but really freeing up the space for the disputes that, uh, you know, can otherwise properly be served uh, by the courts. Uh, and, you know, I want to now move to Cyril Shroff, who once again needs absolutely uh, no introduction. You know, some of the challenges with the uh, adoption of this, uh, you know, of, of something like this is really us. Because we as the lawyers tend to be the ones who are uh, so resistant to change that uh, we you know, tend to stick with what is familiar. So in the context of the pandemic, you know, we've been forced to do all sorts of things. But what in your view is is the way in which we can really do a paradigm shift at this point in time because is yeah we've done the usual things are there ways in which we can take this to the to the next level such that uh, this can actually be more useful thank you very much uh, rahul and uh, delighted to be uh, on this webinar um, and, um, also very inspired what with what uh, amita prant and Justice shri krishna and also uh, pramod said so I want to pick up a few for a point from what they said and build on this and approach this topic really from the direction of access to justice and the rule of law. Both of which are very important because they're the foundation of our nation and the cornerstone of our vision for uh, India's future. To use a cliche, you know, we have the reputation of uh, Tariq Pe Tariq, which is basically justice delayed is justice denied. Now, that being said, I think uh, just to build on what you said uh, just now, Rahul, I think we have a unique once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunity here since this unscheduled pilot uh, has given us uh, the it has kind of cleared our mind in terms of adoption and technology has entered the discussion in a major way. February 2020 and August 2020 are worlds apart. So we must resist the temptation to just solve short term issues, uh, but to use this opportunity to actually reimagine dispute resolution and conflict resolution for the future, for the 21st century and for the post pandemic way. I think 
a lot of what we have done now is what I would bucket as automation, and automation is very different from transformation. Automation will give you just mess for less. There is a big difference between the two, and I think here the opportunity here is to uh, not just use technology to optimize the old way of doing things, but if we can use our imagination and create the right alliances to overhaul the past, actually. And not doing so, I think we run the risk of underwhelming ourselves and missing the real opportunity that, that exists. So whilst I agree that we may have to take baby steps with trying to solve small cases because you need a sandbox for uh, resolving this litigation, uh, the, 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 the arrears, I think we have to be careful that we don't create a digital small causes court and to focus only on low stake, high volume uh, litigation. But I think we need to imagine the larger trajectory where uh, this modern way of dispute resolution becomes interesting and credible also for larger and complex uh, complex disputes. We should not design only for retail. So I think we need to take uh, innovation forward and I believe innovation is not merely taking the existing systems and dropping them into Zoom or WebEx, but to just fundamentally look at it in a very different way and ask ourselves some basic questions. What are these questions? Uh, I've attempted a few. I think the first question we need to imagine is, is justice a service or is it a physical space? So if we go back uh, to uh, many centuries, I think the whole idea that for justice, you have to go to the emperor's darbar or the king's darbar and demand justice, where the jahapana will give, will dispense justice in a public forum. So since that time onwards, and also like taking the British and Western concepts of justice, by default, subconsciously, our idea of access to justice involves going to a physical space, which may now have been substituted by a digital space, but it is about going to a court of law or going to a regulator office and asking for justice using an adversarial format. What we need to think about is whether we can now imagine this as a service and a service which can either be dispensed by the state or in a partnership between the state and the private sector. The second question I think we need to ask ourselves is, what parts of the justice system and the journey are pure process and which parts of it are human sensibility driven exercise of judgment? I think Mr. Amitabh Khan mentioned the use of AI and machine learning and all of that. I think we need to bring that more, more significantly into the conversation and remove a large part of the process driven stuff using AI and leave a smaller space for exercise of judgment of human judgment because that is what will not only give us satisfaction that justice has been given by humanity, but also would have significantly speeded up the whole process. So what role can AI and data and digital play, I think in the entire process needs to be imagined in a, in a, in a deeper way. I believe at this stage, it's quite a shallow, uh, shallow discussion, but we are at the foothills of this journey. There is a big mountain to climb. And I think India has uh, the intellectual horsepower to do this. Now, apart from moving away from this traditional space-based concept of justice, I think we, of course, will need modern tones to make it a better service. We will need better um, you know, servers and better internet and better video conferencing and telepresence and all of that. I regard these as base level tools for providing this service. They are not fundamentally reinventing justice. So when we look at uh, fundamentally reinventing justice, AI will have to find a place. And I'm going to borrow an expression uh, which I actually learned from Amitabh Khan. Is I think this is an opportunity for creating an amazing public-private partnership where the government can become the tech garage for the solution for finding access to justice, using a kind of a Silicon Valley concept. So India, also Indian society's concept of Nyai we see the West by a couple of centuries or, de or eons. So I think we have the right to claim this space. I think India with its culture, with its uh, philosophy, has the moral right to solve the Nyai and the justice problem before anybody else does using, uh, using uh, technology and creating, using government really as a, a tech garage. Why is this important? We have 1.3 billion people we probably have the highest case roster in the world. So we have more raw material to, to play with as well and the biggest need. 
it's only when you have the need that you can solve uh, a bigger, bigger bigger and a larger problem so i think we have the we, we have the technology we have the intellectual horsepower half of silicon valley is uh, you know created these amazing inventions using indian minds so if the state and the private sector can come together in a spirit of innovation using a kind of innovation and a silicon valley mindset we can solve prop not only 3 billion but we can solve for 7 billion people of the world just two last thoughts before i conclude which is uh, from a, just from a, a dispute resolution and access to justice point of view uh, we need to think of better laws as well a lot of the disputes land up where they are and with a, with two sides to the argument because the laws are ambiguous or poorly drafted uh that is a kind of a fountain head of uh, of a lot of litigation so if we avoidance of litigation by better laws is also one way of preventing litigation so that i comment really meant for uh, my friend amitabh khan and the last i think again from a law firm perspective is law firms need to develop a culture of curiosity and an incubator mentality so in our firm you know we have this legal tech incubator called praram we just finished the first cohort of it and in a few months we'll be starting second uh, second cohort and this time the subject is going to be access to justice using legal technology and that's where we are headed because i think this is not just a problem for institutions to solve i think this is a problem really for for the private sector and private commercials to commercial firms to be involved in as well whether you are a big firm or a small firm everybody can contribute So Rahul, I hope this answers uh, your question on what I I think the vision of the future should be. No answers and more because you came up with two points which I you know I've read a lot about this and written a lot about this. Uh, I've always said law firms need to reinvent themselves and and not use the old model. But you also said that laws need to reinvent themselves and that you know that's a really remarkable statement because our laws are written for an age before the internet and before AI. we've got to have laws that are much more written to what the new technology can do and that's a very insightful point yeah and just to build on that now we what we don't want to create is a cpc for online we want to imagine cpc itself on an online cpc is not the answer exactly exactly and so you know just start with our foundational statutes and rebuild them that's sort of what this this is going to take because otherwise we're going to just build off in the online world exactly what we already have in the offline world and we know that's already not working i want to move to krishnava dat um, krishnava dat is a partner for, from argus and this actually segues beautifully into uh, what krishnava and i were talking about krishnava has worked on a paper for cii where he talked about you know digital courts but what was more interesting to me than what he wrote in the paper was what he actually left out of the paper uh and so krishna can i ask you to spend a little time on you know just that whole concept of uh what you wrote on the paper as well as you know the the uh, the elements that we discussed which i thought were really uh, a new way of thinking about this sure <clears throat> thanks rahul so i've actually some time to gather my thoughts because i'm quite fascinated with what i've been hearing and and really encouraged to see that this journey to an unimpeded enforcement of contract is truly underway and and thank you for Aniti Ayog, Mr. Hampton, uh, Mr. Kant, uh, and of course Omidya and Agami for the incredible support in this. Uh, you know there there are two parts to this discussion. One part was the ODR, which is the private uh, private pooled uh, resolution which Pramod alluded to, and uh, the other is the larger part, which is the justice system as a whole, which Mr. Shroff, uh, Justice Sri Krishna also mentioned. and i think to make this narrative a more complete narrative you'll have to speak about both uh i would be probably speaking a bit and taking from two two of those uh, points can you hear uh, so yeah so taking from two of the points of some of the points so uh, yes we wrote about this paper but how we came to it it's just an anecdote few months back when the covid set in i was speaking to some of my investor friends clients who are from global investors and large investor houses uh, fund houses so i said that don't you think that with the covid uh, there would be a lot of opportunities coming up with good assets coming back with some good valuations for you all to invest in to which uh, they said that uh, you know krishna vad there are equally good assets all over the world which will come up covid is not just an indian Uh, issue it's a so good assets will come all over the world an investor will pay 10 cents more to go for the asset where there's certainty of return for the asset okay 
and that obviously ties in with this whole thing of rule of law this whole thing of uh, you know enforceability of contracts and and the ease of doing business contracts and that's which made us write the the cii paper uh, so I wrote the paper for cii on use of technology as a firm we've been fairly uh, pro technology and and believe that you know adopting technology is an immutable truth for even survival and staying ahead for all of us all spaces so there are three questions which um, coming from what i heard three questions uh, actually they are most of them in some form are there in the paper so it's not out of it uh, some of them are so the first question is that as uh, mr shroff said we need to rethink cpc yes so one thing is that today there's been an enormous amount of traction in e filing e courts and video conferencing but what happens if you go down to the ground level you will see an e-filing today where majority of the courts have actually adopted e-filing are still printing out the paper putting it in a pen drive and then uploading it scanning it and then uploading the question the first question is that therefore notary which is a means of authenticated uh, documents and therefore authorize authenticating the authorization do we need a notarization today anymore today the world is transacting in billions of dollars and authenticating the dual process of maker and approver bank systems as you know all the banks would do why can't we simply and because one of the biggest challenges is i'm talking about real life examples where the e filing becomes a major problem because you've got to print and then take and then upload a simple system which does not need too much of an investment because it's already there in existence where you can file literally what we mean by e filing not printing and and scanning and and, and then uploading but literally e filing with a two way authentication with the client and the advocate that's the first part the second question i think uh, mr kant had said very nicely that let the courts deal with more complex nuance matters exactly especially in this nclt and ibc regime my question which i and these three questions are actually for thought and deliberation and i'm sure there will be a lot of debate on that is i believe this was also said in the last that do we need oral hearing for most of the matters today things like which are uh, which are summary proceedings by a section 7 application where there is very limited question of fact not complicated questions of fact or nuanced arguments of law drt application some of the consumer forums like wipo which is the world intellectual property organization has this uniform domain uh, disputes domain uh, name disputes uh, resolution process where there's no hearing the the complainant files the respondent files an objection the complainant gives a rejoinder the arbitration panel passes the order it's simple so if you stand today in an nclt you will see a lot of time the tarik pe tarik is wasted on the lawyers saying exactly what is written on the petition it's not a question of very nuanced argument of fact nuanced argument of law can we not relook at it and say that there is a whole host of summary proceedings which can be done even without a hearing if the hearing there can be at the discretion of the judge if there is a question of law or a question of fact which is more complicated or common question of both then the judge can of course ask the 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 litigants to come and place their submissions but otherwise generally do we are we as a society open to the fact and say listen there are these simple things which is a drt or section 7 simple we don't need hearings that's um two and the last question of course uh, you know there is a lot of debate on both sides is this uh, the vc video conference hearing and i am not on the technology i know there's been a a lot of debates on you know with, with one faction and truly so that maybe there's a large diaspora of advocates and lawyers and litigants who may not have access to proper uh, proper infrastructure and whilst that is being made whilst that is being developed can't we not have certain and, and in our report is very clear that countries which has adopted uh, this video conferencing here for especially against summary proceedings which does not have a trial are actually having far more expeditious as well as cheaper access to justice so can't we have some where let say, the corporates which which are dealing with let's say tens of crores or millions of dollars they can't say that we don't have the infrastructure can't spend can't those be imagine if today you have whether it's a sat or an nclt where you don't need to travel all the way 
to a Bombay or a Delhi, but you can actually access a justice. Sri Krishna said justice comes to the door. Okay, I'm not about the now. I'm not talking about the debate on people who cannot or may not. I'm talking about people who surely can. They are the ones who are talking about millions of dollars of disputes. Can't they be made mandatorily so that they don't need to say so there's a cost saving, a time saving? Justice delivery becomes faster and cheaper. Though. So, in a question of the debate, whilst the debate is there for uh, the ones who don't have, let's take the question of the debate to the ones who have and who can, and to that extent. I think, I mean, I mean, you know, if you look at justice system, the data that we have today, and a lot can be done, so much more because this is the only sector possibly that we are, you know, in this 150 years of data is available. As I said, 100 and no other sector has so much of data available. And if we have the proper tools eventually, which is you know proper machine learning and proper tools, that later that if we can harness that data, today the data has been today we are harnessing. There is a huge impact on in the legal service business, but the technology used more in the delivery of legal service, not for delivery yet of justice, which needs still needs to be done. I think those are the three questions, and uh, that's where I can. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna. Uh, as always, uh, you know, you uh, pulled another rabbit out of the hat with that last one that we hadn't discussed. I want to go straight across to Amit Kapoor. Amit is the uh, joint managing partner of JSA. And Amit has, in the course of the pandemic, uh, had a lot of actual firsthand experience with um, this new uh, reality, as you know, many of us uh, have. But Amit, can you can you share shed some light on you know how that's been and whether that's uh, a, you know a sort of a, a the kind of reality that we are hoping for or is that a dystopia that we should be moving away from is it some something in the middle? So, thank you, thank you for the opportunity, uh, to Niti. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I think uh, the speakers earlier have already uh, quite like what Krishnawa said set me thinking away from what I had originally looked at. Uh, so to answer your question straight away, the experience has been, I personally have conducted 60 matters already since the time of lockdown and uh, at least 20 of them have been final hearings uh, and the same hearings which were normally conducted. So let me give you the good news, uh, both in terms of filings and hearings, which had earlier taken, they were reheard because of the pandemic situation. So matters which were heard over a course of seven days were concluded in a session and a half because we all filed 20 page written notes. The court uh, recorded the proceedings and uh, the transcription was available and therefore it brought uh, the urgency to come cut to the chase and deal with the issues. Uh, just as anecdotal evidence, uh, I still remember without naming names because some of them are not amongst us anymore, but very celebrated seniors, counsel who are attorney generals and, and were great practitioners of commercial law. In uh, one of the Section 3 Foreign Awards Arbitration in Delhi High Court, I was agog to see that the matter went on for 63 days. And many of us around on this panel know that Section 3 Foreign Awards uh, Act is a pure question of is there an arbitrable dispute and are you covered by the convention? And that's the end of the story. It should not be more than an hour's hearing, but it went on. So, I mean, the reality of the challenge of wastage of time lies with us as much as the process. Uh, so, I think uh, I would uh, completely agree with Cyril. Uh, the opportunity comes uh, pretty much in the way Doris Goodwill, the famous Harvard historian, said in times of crisis things become possible that would not be possible in ordinary times. And we are at the at the fortunate cusp of uh, an economy which is quite digitally inclined, has done well on the back of digital prog progress. And yet we are 760 plus districts. We have 680 odd district courts. You go to revenue courts and you get to the grassroots, you get to the consumers, you suddenly start realizing, uh, while uh, I appreciate what Pramod has shared, Krishna has shared, a huge barrier which comes in the way of the common man accessing justice. Because as Justice Sri Krishna said, if Justice Sri Krishna and I have frame freezes with the line dropping, then you can imagine what happens to a common guy who's facing a dispute. Uh, so three very, four, four very important points that I would like to bring uh, to your attention, given that ODR is not actually limited to courts and tribunals, but it's more outside the courts and seeking to resolve matters which need not unnecessarily clog the arteries of justice as it were. I think the first most important thing is to gain credibility. And I'm happy to hear from Pramod that that's what I heard learned earlier, that the mechanism of getting neutrals has got credibility to it. Because 
if any any corporate entity, whether it's it's government owned or private or a partnership, does not have a credible mechanism, I don't have confidence that I'm actually going to the lion's den to be told what the take it or leave it solution is. There is no question of moving ahead. So there is a, a vacuum where, uh, as Cyril said, firms like ours and lawyers otherwise, it is not necessary that it's the bastion of only law firms, to look at developing and supporting institutional development, which is independent of parties. If ICICI had the opportunity of having three platforms, which are completely independent and has uh, men of metal like Mr. Justice Sri Krishna and others lending their time and support, uh, and, and possibly, if required, be there to settle principles. I think they would be happy to go there rather than try and go and uh, uh, lobby around and work for some neutrals to come and join them and then to work around that mechanism to try and be counterintuitive in working against the interests of the bank to take the information asymmetry away and make a neutral platform. So that's an institutional vacuum we need to address in Egypt. The second is the skill and access vacuum. Uh, let's face it, uh, if, if I represent or I am a corporate entity and my consumer is coming for a grievance redressal or I'm reaching out for that resolution, I come with a much better ability in terms of knowledge, skill set, acumen, access to uh, resources. So we need to then in that institutional mechanism empower them with a panel of guidance that comes, which at least is available on a digital platform. For anybody to go at a punch of a button, feed in a few questions and get answers. Yes, these are your rights. These are your protections. So that when I go and negotiate, I have the ability to say, I believe I'm entitled to this. Can we discuss and resolve it? The third very important thing, I think, which is equally important to my mind, is training the mindset of approaching a dispute. The incentive is to prolong the dispute or get into dispute. But that's a short term incentive. The actual incentive is to try and resolve because that's when the entity which is resolving gets the goodwill of the people that they deal with. And unless we change our mindset on that, we will, at the drop of a pin, run to disputes rather than run away from disputes. And let's face it, the cost of disputes in Indian economy, unlike the West, we love to always compare us to the US, UK and Europe, where your, your debt financing comes at minus 2 and 0 and 1% today. We still look at 14 and 16. And we are still looking at the fact that well, there is a moratorium, but six months from now, I'm facing the guillotine again. So we need to get real about the fact that there is an important value that time has in our lives. And if it does, then timely dispute resolution through a credible mechanism would go a long, long way resolving. But it will be a mosaic that would grow gradually. What you can achieve in a Delhi or a Bombay or a Bangalore is not something that you'll achieve in the hinterland in Tripura or in, in one of the uh, uh, remote areas, uh, tier three city or a rural uh, group of people. So, so you need to, uh, we need to, and this platform is all about Niti, uh, trying to get us together to think about solving it for the citizen. So there is one such thing that I know because I've been discussing with Desh and we were looking at it. They're looking at uh, trying to get this digital access to the common man using the hole in the wall experiment of an IIT foundation. Very simple experiment they undertook. Two CSR funds placed uh, computers in the JJ clusters for the absolutely the people who cannot afford to think about computers. And suddenly the kids were getting equipped. Even the people who were living there were getting equipped to understand what this is, get over the mindset of uh, this whole conundrum of how to tackle and go to a computer and deal with it. And uh, they are running programs where in three or four months training, they are able to equip youngsters who are dropouts from school, can't afford to go to college, to join MNCs and do backroom work. Now, consider that as a platform, combine it with what a court offers or uh, the commercial world offers and place it in the hands of people through choppers, through district courts and other forums. You suddenly have a very empowered, and, and then you have access to knowledge that, okay, fine. If, a, if an employee is looking at the fact that he's facing termination, he can punch in two questions to find an answer in his language of choice. What are his rights? So I think we need to bridge these gaps before we'll come to a credible solution at a country of 130 crores. We are not talking of just addressing it in the creamy layer, but it will be gradual. You can't wait for the bing bag to happen. There will be always trepidation and apprehensions when you approach an ICICI bank forum, unless you get to learn that he has a neutral. 
So there is a credibility attached to it. They are not trying to thrust it down your gullet. And I think those are the challenges that we need to get over. Insofar as the last point that I'll make for your consideration, uh, being conscious of time, I think I think the technology being something which is available, accessible, and our ability to innovate is something which is proven by now. We just need to remove the shackles of our of our frame of thought. If you continue to, as, as Cyril said, if you continue to think of justice as only the courtroom, rule of law, or resolution of a dispute only in a particular platform, we are always going to fall far short, and we'll shortchange ourselves. I think the digital frame, this nine by 13 source through which I'm meeting all of you, in spite of not being able to meet any of you, is the opportunity that offers all of us a very different dimension. Now we are in ether. And from our respective spaces, if we can offer this through stuff like the NIIT Foundation's hole in the wall, which is available to the most uh, uh, economically challenged sects of the society, to get equipped to it and treat it only as a tool to communicate rather than a huge barrier in their minds of what to do with it. I think we'll do a lot and, and go a long way in resolving this. So I think it's about combining technology and the opportunity with the necessity. Uh, to leave with the last thought, which is a joke that I uh, would always put to Rahul or any other friend in the technology world, this is one virus that the technology world loves. This is the only virus I've known them loving. They're already always scared of all viruses otherwise. So here is uh, an opportunity coming out of adversity, and let's hope we can make the most of it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amit. Uh, I, I do indeed love that joke, but this is a joke that's been told before. So I will laugh, uh, even though uh, this is not the first time I'm laughing at it. I really like the fact that if this new technology world constrains us in a way uh, that uh, essentially uh, you have cut down speeches uh, of senior counsel to these um, remarkably small periods of time. Whoever thought that that, uh, that they would come, that uh, because everyone's afraid of the internet connection going down or because the transcripts are done, uh, we're going to see uh, senior counsel run out of uh, wind uh, in their speeches. I want to, we're, we're already over time, but this has been so fascinating. Everyone has come up with new um, thoughts that we hadn't even discussed before. I want to turn to Ajay Bell. Uh, the last time I spoke uh, to uh, Ajay, he was in his uh, uh, in the wonderful, uh, wonderfully idyllic surroundings of Goa, uh, and um, we discussed, uh, you know, some of the really remarkable things that he's been doing and thinking about in legal reform. Uh, and once again, Ajay came at it from a completely different angle. We're all thinking about, you know, High Court, Supreme Court. Ajay is thinking about it from a completely different angle. Ajay, can you just take us through some of those thoughts and, uh, you know, anything else that you have conscious that we're already five minutes over the allotted time? Thank you, Rahul. It's great to hear everybody. Good afternoon, Mr. Kant, uh, Justice Sri Krishna and panelists. So I think uh, very quickly, Rahul, uh, I, I think enough has been said about online dispute resolution to make the point that online dispute resolution, whether with or without judicial intervention, is something we must promote. And clearly, anything that is an impediment, whether in, in, in the law or in procedures or in any, any other way that reduces its efficacy must be eliminated. However, it, as I see it, it uh, online as a means of interactive communication and technology with its infinite possibilities actually are means to an end. And they should have a much greater role to play in making the mindset change. And I remember I spoke to you about mindset and to such an odd mindset. I'm delighted that Justice Sri Krishna and Amit referred to the mindset change. And I'm referring to the mindset change, which actually makes people realize that we need a wider approach, broader approach to judicial reforms and to ease of business. And these are only mechanisms that are uh, available uh, in that direction. And when I look at judicial reform, I look across beyond courts to investigative agencies, tribunals, regulators, revenue collection agencies, and all of them. So I would refer to that more as uh, uh, online facilitation. And I'm going to share some very low hanging fruits, uh, even though you can talk about a lot of things. Uh, also, because I know that Mr. Kant has the uncanny habit that if he likes something, he gets it done. So I'll start with a very simple one, investigations. Today, our default mechanism for seeking information is summoning somebody. And that creates the massive problems. It, it results in complaints of harassment. 
people complain that the, the, the statements are made under coercion, all of those issues go on and on. Online, audiovisual, means of communication, means of cross-examination can solve those problems in a major way and make the process much more transparent. So income tax, as you know, has already started the process of e-assessment. Now they're trying to bring in a pilot-less assessment mechanism. So this is a low-hanging fruit, which can have a serious impact because all of a sudden ease of business, which is related to agencies not harassing you, ED, CBI, you all along have a different process. Now you can use technology and online with a means to gather information and also with a view to conduct any investigation, cross-examination, examination, and the you know, person can see he can then take, he or she can't later say that he was browbeaten or she was browbeaten because you know, the, the, the event will speak for itself. The second area, which I think is very important, is where technology can harness data collection. One of the biggest challenges that you see today is that our data, and I'm not talking about legal data, I'm talking about pendency data. The data is available largely for district courts and high courts. It's practically unavailable for tribunals. It's scanty for your agencies, for investigation panel agencies and other places. Hardly anything is available. Now, if that data was collected, and properly put in shape, it would do two things. One, it would show the perilous nature that our system has reached and put pressure on everybody in the ecosystem, including the lawyers, including the, uh, the, the folks who have to appoint judges, because it will show you how, how desperately broke the system is across not just the courts, but across so many other places where actually justice is being dispensed. Secondly, and very importantly, if it is properly analyzed, it will give you the ability to make an impact assessment of changes you bring about. So I'll give you a simple example. Today, there are close to 2.3 pro criminal cases pending just before the low courts. If we knew how many of them were summons cases, smaller offenses, and how many of them were warrants cases, we would be able to make an assessment that if we increase the level or increase the number of disputes that could be or, 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 or criminalities that can be compounded, would it have a meaningful impact in declogging the courts and reducing the pipeline for the future? So the way I look at it is online is a facilitation mechanism and technology is a tool to help us in a much broader spectrum to declog the courts, to make it easier for uh, matters to be settled and for basically reducing the future pipeline and assess through data and through other means how that can actually work. And then we can come to the, you know, the bigger solutions and hope to find uh, answers for the future. But there are some low-hanging fruits that can be uh, attended to as well. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ajay. Uh, the power of data, I mean, I'm the last one uh, to deny how powerful it can be. Uh, so absolutely, there is, I, I think that's been a recurring theme. Uh, there is inherent in us so much data that we can we can actually use. Uh, we're uh, short of time, but I want to, uh, you know, conclude with Purnima Sampath um, from the Tata Group. And, you know, we've sort of sandwiched us, I've sandwiched us lawyers between the two general counsels because Really, you know, we are uh, sort of the filling inside uh, the sandwich. It, 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 none of this holds together if the general counsels don't actually agree and consider uh, some of the things that we are making uh, to be useful. Uh, and, you know, when I spoke to Purima uh, about the way in which she and uh, the Tata group are thinking about this, I found uh, some really optimistic resonance in some of the things that she said, and I wanted to end with that. Uh, because uh, yeah, it's good to go out with a bank. So Purnima, don't let me down. Uh, I'll turn you turn this over to you uh, for uh, you just to wind up wind up the panel. Thank you, Mr. Kant and Justice Sri Krishna. Uh, you know, one theme that's been we've had many diverse speakers, and one theme that's been constant through is, and I've heard virtually everyone say it, including Ajay. How do we decongest the judicial system? So you know, we've been grappling with this question. From a different point of view, decongesting the judicial system is a social prerogative. I can't convince a corporate group or a conglomerate to think along those lines. So, you know, Amit Kapoor said it and Cyril said it. Can we look at justice as a concept outside of the courtroom? And two years ago, we 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 worked internally with various startup companies. And one of the key things that came out was, you know, 
one factor that tilts the scales in decision making is brand protection and goodwill. You, either it's gentle and underlying when it comes to deciding how things go, or it's blatantly out there. Do I make a payment? Do I settle? What is the, what is the impact on my reputation and brand? You know, that got me thinking, instead of, you know, cases being dumped with, in the legal teams of various startup companies, what if we were to look at it as a brand protection exercise and something that feeds into the, the Tata ethos of, you know, good products, good services, and some sort of a social component when we work in, in, in India. And we came up with some framework, which I like to popularly call the, the Tata Ombudsperson or consumer framework, where we essentially create a technology platform. So we studied litigation across, I'm going to walk you through a bit of a case study, and these views are mine, not those of the Tata group. But we looked at litigation across many Tata companies. I looked at the B2B businesses and the B2C businesses. And there were thousands and thousands of cases that came up. We digitized the papers, we fed it into systems. And when I looked at it, I figured there were three buckets, not rocket science. There are consumer cases, there are cases with business partners, and three, there are cases with the government. Cases with the government is something which is beyond our control. We cannot do much about it right now. But I felt the cases with consumers and business partners is something we could work very actively to bring down so that net result, the judicial system is decongested and the group is happy because it's brand protection. If, and um, so we came up with what I call Vision 2025, where it's like a five-year plan, so to speak where the first two years we focus on B2C cases. There is a technology platform of fantastic portal, state of the art, where consumers, you know, they have a problem with an AC, you have a problem with jewelry you buy, you have a problem with your power bills, uh, and you're ready to, normally you would go to a consumer court, but here you would log into one of our systems. You upload a bill, there is a form which teaches you what to fill in, what is the essence of your, of your complaint. And the group perhaps, and today I talk about it, for the Tata group, but this is scalable to other business conglomerates. You have a panel of independent judges. You have a panel of certain technical experts that looks into this, reads the complaint, and quickly achieves some sort of resolution. So it's pre-litigation. It's kept within the group, so to speak. You build it into purchase con into uh, uh, invoices, purchase orders, and contracts. You agree as a conglomerate that the decision will be binding. We as a conglomerate will not appeal it. The consumer may choose to, we won't. And similarly, I felt after two years, let's scale this now to business partners, retailers, stockists, distributors, franchisees, uh, maybe even JV partners. A separate model, which again, you know, the, the ethos of the consumer is different, the business partners different. So you, the same platform would not work for both. But in essence, a distinguished panel of independent judges and experts to help resolve this. So. Ideally, by 2025, uh, the group is focused on seminal cases, cases that impact corporate laws in India, so cases that are going to take India forward in terms of, you know, uh, different areas, but we're not talking about small consumer and business cases. Um, I'm optimistic about this. I think uh, the wins are in our favor. There's a good technology platform that our companies have created. Every function in every department, in, 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 in a company has been forced to ride the digital wave, whether they like it or not. Compliance is digitized, litigation is digitized. So how do we take what is digitized? How do we take the data and take it to the next level of actual resolution is, uh, is something I'm optimistic about. And I really hope we, we, you know, different business groups sort of buy into this and a good chunk of cases are taken out of the judicial system. Thanks, Fatima. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, themes that have been resonating is how do we get consensus? How do we get the different parties, you know, the plaintiff and the defendant, to get on board with this new system? And if companies can think about litigation uh, from the perspective of their brand to realize that, you know, the brand is not in delaying, the brand is actually in resolving the disputes. This is something that's come through in so many other uh, conversations today. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, I wanted to do closing remarks, but you know we don't have time for closing remarks. It, uh, I don't have uh, a, a time other than to thank all the participants in the panel: Pramod Rao, Siru Shroff, Krishnava Dutt, Amit Kapoor, Ajay Bell, and Purnima Sampath. And then to hand it over to Sachin Malan, 
uh, who is the co-founder of Agami to, uh, I think, let us know about the ODR landscape. Sachin, over to you. Thank you so much, Rahul. I'll just, uh, I'm gonna share something that I'm presenting. So give me a second to get it on. There we go. So let me check with uh, Varun. Uh, can you see the full screen? Not yet, Sachin. You'll have to hit We can see. Yeah, now we can. Okay, awesome, great. So it has uh, fallen on me to uh, do something that I, I always enjoy doing, which is to speak the voice of the entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and let us not forget that as we discuss this issue, uh, it's the startups, the entrepreneurs who are starting, doing entrepreneurs often more than 25 hours, 24 hours in a day working on, uh, you know, this problem. They are the ones looking at different dispute types and mapping them to solutions that can help resolve those dispute types uh, through a combination of technology and data and behavioral insights and so much more, right? So uh, just thoroughly enjoy uh, always presenting a peek. And this is nothing more than that. You know, I have uh, 10 minutes. So just a peek into the startup ecosystem, the ODR startup ecosystem. Pramod was referring to it a bit before when he said that there are institutions out there and he was referring to many of these uh, startups. The word startup never does anyone justice, but the, but startups who are offering ODR services very credibly in the country and working double time to make sure that the quality of neutrals and technology keeps up with the needs of uh, what we have. So let's dive into a little glimpse of this. I think the first thing that's already been clarified, and I don't think it needs to be repeated, so I'm not gonna spend too much time is that you know, it's uh, it's very very uh, tempting to fall into the trap of thinking that uh, ODR is ADR, you know, digitized. And uh, the truth is that it can sometimes be much more. In fact, often technology is called the fourth party in uh, in ODR because of how it could disrupt it. And Mr. Shroff referred to it as well when he said that it's important that we don't look at it from the point of view of automation but transformation. Uh, we we take the blinkers off and see what the possibilities are when we're designing solutions. And I particularly enjoyed in the in the lead up to this uh, to this meeting talking to some of the business entrepreneurs because business entrepreneurs are always thinking five steps ahead. They're always thinking about what could be, and and they are remarkably uh, unbaggaged uh, in terms of thinking about solutions. So, but ADR is a combination of ADR techniques with technology, data, and of course that fantastic factor which is design. Uh, if you look at just some of the leading startups in the country today, uh, these are names that I think you should become familiar with. You're going to hear about them. Some of them are going to get to a, a nation scale, uh, Center for Online Resolution of Disputes, SAMA, uh, RDO, Law Solve 360, Address Now, Carter, Crec, Just Act, WebNyai, all at different stages of development. Some of them still to uh, launch commercial commercial services and some at a very advanced stage, not just servicing double digit enterprises, but also powering local dalits. Some of the references that were made uh, to the fact that there are now three active uh, local dalits being done online. Some of them have been powered by these ODR startups. I think what's remarkable about these startups and, and this really gives me tremendous hope is that Unlike other sectors where sometimes it's it's each person for themselves, uh, for the last two years now, the startups have shared resources, collaborated. They know they're competing, don't get me wrong, but they know that there's a bigger game here, which is access to justice and ease of doing business. And they, in the last two years alone, they've met multiple times to work on how the industry can actually be progressed. How do you have self-regulation? How do you ensure quality of neutrals? Uh, I think that this trend of being able to compete furiously while also having each other's back and interests in mind is the trend that we want to actively nurture in the Indian ecosystem. We can do this differently from how it is done in, in other parts of the world because our values uh, are different. Some of the profiles, you know, 80% uh, of the startups have a lawyer co-founder. Most of them are multiple founder startups. So I think that's important to keep in mind but most of them have a lawyer co-founder. 80% uh, of them have an engineer co-founder. I think that's huge because we know that this is a collaboration between law and technology and other things. 50% uh, of them have a mediator co-founder. 
uh, to promote point that it's always better to resolve something collaboratively before forcing an adjudication. And if that is a cultural part of how we're offering services, then nothing like it. And 40% of them have an arbitrator go for. So very wide mix. There are, of course, others. There's also an, there are also people who are artists and theater, and they bring everything to these solutions that they're designing. But these are some of the uh, centers of gravity in the founder profiles. The kind of disputes they're looking at right now, personal loans, landlord tenant disputes, e-commerce in a big way. And you know, the following uh, panel will really go into some of these categories, employment for sure, supply chain. Uh, and payments. Uh, of course, I'm sure many of you would have followed RBI's uh, announcement that ODR will be a part of uh, you know, dispute resolution and payments. And this has been something in the works for a while. Many people have been uh, working towards it, but uh, it just represents one more in this uh, you know, rapidly increasing movement towards ODR. Some of these aspirations, I love to relay them back. And these are particularly messages for heads of law firms and heads of business. Uh, you know, I, I won't take all of them, but just a few. Uh, Pranjal of Sama says, head of legal, head heads of legal should engage with startups to sincerely explore the different dispute categories, uh, especially those early in their dispute life cycles. The point that was made that rather than letting it get toxic, Aditya Shivkumar of RDO says, uh, legal industry leaders and business can play a big role to take it to the doorstep of every Indian with the creativity and power of technology. Badri of Cord says, look at ODR as a means to resolve even high value complex disputes. A point that was made earlier today. Let us not fall into the trap, always thinking of it purely from the point of view of small and medium. That could be a starting point, but let us define the goal as being uh, all types of disputes because then the technology will really break the boundaries and go to the next level. Bhargavi of Address now says, industry bodies should be encouraged to adopt ODR and to educate their members. Mayank of Law, Law Wagon says, online processes are as good, if not better, than most offline, and we need to recognize this. Kanchan of Carter says, as leaders in the sector, law firms should engage and collaborate proactively with online offerings and platforms. Prashant of Just Act says, so many businesses involving, so many disputes involving businesses are with government. Is it, and I think this is a huge thing, which is, can we do something there? And, and that this goes to the question of policies and, and laws themselves, which would unlock tremendous energy in the ecosystem, uh, given how many disputes are with government as well. Bhavan of Presol says the legal fraternity should encourage and advise their clients to adopt ODR mechanisms for categories of disputes imminently suitable for ODR. Chittu, who herself is an absolute ODR pioneer, the founder of Modria, and now, now has founded Crec ODR in India. She says companies should recognize that as long as the direction is clear, that innovation is often just about going ahead and doing it. You know, just do it may just be the best slogan ever in the history of marketing. Vishwam of Webnyaya says leaders at top law firms should advise their clients that resolving disputes online is a valid and acceptable form of resolution. So just some voices from those who, like I said, are spending 25 hours a day working on ODR solutions and will solve a lot of the problems that we are articulating today. Uh, finally, I'd just like to say that, you know, in my view, heads of legal industry and, and heads of enterprises are arguably the most important stewards of this change. The question must be how to do it and not if. And really, that's where our energy should be directed. Let's not point out uh, just the problems. Let's point out the pathways. And let's leverage our influence, our knowledge, and our networks to make them happen. Let me just stop uh, with the, you know, uh, this piece. Uh, I'm going to move on to, I know we're short of time, so I'm going to move on to uh, the next panel, which I think, which I'm incredibly excited by, because if what I spoke about was the voice of uh, startups, then it's about time that we really dig into the voice of business. And uh, we now have a discussion on uh, understanding industry applications for ODR. This is when we start looking from the perspective of different types of business businesses and see how ODR could be applied. Uh, and I think that this is a conversation that is going to become a uh, trigger uh, for uh, much more value to be unlocked because others from other leaders in similar sectors could recognize the opportunities and act on them. Before I do that, just a couple of housekeeping announcements for everyone here. We have, we do recognize there are many of you who are attending on WebEx and even more uh, following uh, on YouTube. Do, even if you, your questions, uh, if, you, if you have questions, even if those questions can't be addressed during the conversation right now, those are really important for us because this is a movement that extends far beyond the leaders 
on this platform. So please do put in your questions on chat or do share your questions even on the streams. We will collect those questions and make sure that the points that are raised do not go unaddressed. So please make sure that you, you put your questions. Let us not uh, miss out on that. The other thing I will say is that uh, we are also mindful of the fact that you know there's a lot of other work happening uh, in the country on ODR and as a uh, as a coalition that is trying to make sure ODR becomes a reality, we want to. There's many other things that are that are that will be supported in this process. There will be a continuous dialogue to ensure that you know the converse, The dialogue is not just about these meetings, but there's also an effort that if anything is being suggested, it is being pushed out for public opinion and the opinion of other influencers in the space. So please do watch out for more efforts to make sure that we get even more voices involved in. Uh, developing the ODR movement in India. Uh, let me introduce the fantastic panelists that we have for the next panel. Uh, as I said, we're going to dig into the industry applications for ODR. We're going to get into the specific use cases for how ODR can be applied in different industry verticals. I am joined in this by a group representing very different types of uh, industries. And that's what makes it fun because uh, otherwise there's a tendency to think ODR is a little uh, cute little technology play, works for e-commerce, that's it, you know? And it's, it, that's a huge misunderstanding. That's like assuming digitization of Indian industry is just e-commerce, which is uh, a big undersell. So I am joined by uh, six amazing people. Uh, Amit Basin, the general manager of Legal Unilever, Shilpa Kumar, the investment partner of Omidya Network India, Karthikian Ramaswamy, the senior vice president of Capital Float, Smriti Subramaniam, the general counsel of Snapdeal, Vinay Kesri, the general counsel of Setu, and Rakesh Verma, the head of payment products of Reliance Industries. So you can see the landscape, broad sweep, different perspectives. Each one of them also, you know, when I was looking at their profiles, comes from different industries before this so they come from so you know uh if you pick up any one of them and look back at their uh, their worlds before they got into their current roles you'll see they came from very different spaces so that they bring this fantastic uh perspective let me begin this exploration with uh amit amit love to hear from you when you look at odr and you've been looking at adr and odr for some time now you know, I've been tracking Unilever and Unilever has been looking at it for a while. What for you are the big opportunities that jump out? We'd love to hear from you on that. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Sachin. And, uh, uh, you know, glad to be part of uh, this conversation. Uh, congratulations to you, Nitya CI, for organizing this conversation, which is quite ahead of time, uh, very timely as well. Uh, and I think clearly making way for the for the future. Um, I, I think the case for a effective ODR mechanism has already been made by all the eminent speakers uh, in this session so far. So I think I don't I don't will not go into it. I will really try to bring the industry perspective and uh, uh, you know what industry thinks uh, you know this can uh, how it can help. And I, I will go a little back in time, as you rightly said, in Unilever, we have been kind of trying to see how we bring in alternate dispute resolution as a, as a way to resolve disputes. Uh, and actually, we, we pioneered this in, in the early 2000, when we realized that there are a whole lot of shares related litigation in the times when the shares were uh, in physical mode. And there were a lot of disputes with respect to shareholders. Uh, you know, somebody has transferred, other one has not received it. And these disputes got accumulated, and there were hundreds of them, hundreds of them. Uh, and as a company, I could not do anything. I was only a custodian holding these shares for the for these shareholders because I am not going to benefit. And I, for all practical purposes, we were the performer parties in this uh, in this uh, disputes. But we thought there is a real reason for me to kind of unlock the value because there's a value which has got logged. The shares are logged. The dividends are logged. Shareholders are not getting the benefit of it, and therefore, as a responsible company. We thought, let us do something about it. So we came out with this idea of alternate dispute resolutions for shares related cases. Uh, and uh, we appointed retired judges from high courts in 
five three, four reasons at that time we had uh, uh, and requested them to really adjudicate on these matters and we brought both the parties on table uh, and we said whatever the honorable judge will decide based on the facts of the case we will you know accordingly kind of transfer the shares to the individual or there may be a settlement as well if the facts are are complex uh, and i think that became a huge success because you know, all those cases suddenly we were able to kind of resolve 80 percent of such cases and it was a huge value unlock for the shareholders so it worked very well for us we then replicated that model for a lot of our disputes with our customers right a lot of our disputes with our vendors as well as some of our consumer cases we uh, uh, kind of uh, use that and it also worked beautifully for us so we have been kind of doing this and doing it uh, you know for quite some time now and it's been very very successful and as the person from Tata said, you know, I will possibly be repeating same. If if I look at it, while in all the conversations so far, a case has been made very clearly that ODR can be used for all types of litigation. If I have to talk from a few low hanging fruits, uh, you know, those will be first the consumer cases, right? And talking from a lens of a consumer goods company, I am there because consumers are there. As a company or as an industry, I don't want to fight with my consumers. And these were very pity issues of, uh, you know, the service not being delivered or the product does not meeting the expectation of a consumer, which can easily be resolved. What is happening today is those disputes linger for years together, creating a frustration for the consumer. And as somebody rightly said, there is a brand deterioration happening because I have lost that consumer, right? And I don't want to lose that consumer. I want to bring, win the consumer back. So if there can be a mechanism by which I can explain my case in point to the consumer and very well, there may be cases where that the company I'm at fault, I should be given an opportunity to rectify that and then win the consumer back. So consumer cases clearly, I think, is an area where uh, this can be a huge success uh, and, uh, and, and stand to reason because in the, in the industry ecosystem, I don't think any industry would like to fight with its consumer. So I think that's one case uh, that I would clearly recommend. I think other one is, uh, you know, my customers and my vendors, right, who are again part of my ecosystem. They are helping me running my business and there may be disputes, there may be different point of views. Uh, and again, ODR kind of a mechanism can clearly help us resolving and resolving them fast because a value get, commercial value gets stuck because of the litigation leading to frustration for the business. None of the forward looking businesses would like to really get their value stuck for uh, uh, these kind of a litigation. So if a mechanism could be there by which these disputes can be solved quickly, I think they will be very, very welcome uh, by the, by the uh, uh, companies. The last one, again, you talked about it briefly is the employment and labor cases, right? And again, I, I think that is an area where one should definitely look at how we can bring in uh, ODR kind of a mechanism. And two of these areas that I talked about, uh, consumer cases and labor cases. Already we see there are reforms happening. There's a new consumer law that has come in play. Right time possibly for us to uh, kind of bring in ODR as a mechanism for that so that we can really have only issues which are worthy of taking to the courts and all other issues can be resolved between the consumers and the industry. Likewise for labor cases, new wage codes are coming in. If we can make a way for ODRs, uh, I think huge unlock both for the employee fraternity and employer fraternity. Again, you don't want to fight in your ecosystem. And all the three examples I am giving you are the people who are the ecosystem of industry, the employees, consumers, vendors. You don't want to fight with them, right? There may be a different point of view, but in the long term, this ecosystem is the one which is creating value for the shareholders. So I think with that logic, uh, I would say these are three areas that I would, you know, really prioritize. There may be other areas where OD ODR can definitely be worked, but if I have to pick up, these will be the top three. Thank you, Sachin. Yeah, that's yeah, interesting, Amit. And I think what I find really remarkable, remarkable about this is the amount of energy that gets value and energy that gets unlocked by virtue of doing this, right? Like if you save, I mean, one thing is of course the direct saving of time, energy, cost. The other is that the opportunity cost of that, you know, with in terms of trust, in terms of all those things, you know, a little follow up question for you, you know, in your previous models, you looked at, I, I guess, using a retire, retired judges or retired public uh, positions was a proxy for credibility and legitimacy, right? Do you feel that the, proc the credibility and legitimacy can come in other ways as you go about partnering how to do this at scale? 
Yes, uh, you know, you I, I think asked a very relevant point, which is if any, uh, you know, alternate system that has to work, uh, you know, we have to look at, and all of us are lawyers here, but we have to really look at from the point of view of people we are dealing with. We are dealing with consumers who has an in, instance of breach of trust, right? Uh, you are maybe dealing with a, with a customer where there's an instance of breach of trust. The first principle for me is credibility and the trust, right? They should be convinced that if they are going in this forum, they are going to get a absolutely unbiased uh, uh, right kind of a decision, right? If there is a question mark on the credibility, if there is a slightest doubt to say that this is something which because a big company is starting, uh, you know, the, the, the rule, rule will go in their favor. If that is an apprehension, the system can never work. And hence, we had brought in very credible people whose uh, integrity, whose decision making is absolutely impeccable. We brought them and said, you decide uh, uh, and we will follow. And in fact, you know, like uh, some the person from Tata also said, we had this thing of saying the rule will be applicable on us. We will not go into appeal. It is not applicable on you. I think that took the trust level to a different thing saying, okay, as a company, we are putting so much of trust saying you will not appeal. As a consumer, I'm not closing doors for you. If you are not convinced, you still go and appeal it. So I think that that is very, very fundamental for me. So trust, uh, unbiased opinion, having a confidentiality into the process. Um, and the last one, I would say some degree of finality, right? I think the legal system that we have in our country, you know, you can keep on litigating and keep on lingering the matters for years. I think somewhere we have to find a way to also bring a degree of finality to the dispute because again, as I said, these are very, very small matters can be resolved very quickly. Uh, uh, and therefore you also have to kind of find a way where consumer and companies both think that if I get into this particular process, it will bring a degree of finality to the dispute. So those are fundamentals. And I, I believe still that even an ODR to be successful, some of these uh, basic tenants has to be followed. Great, great. Thank you so much, Amit. I think perfect time to go and take this inquiry to Shilpa. Shilpa brings not just the perspective of an investor, Shilpa also brings the perspective of someone who's been a leader in the finance sector. Shilpa, uh, what can you sh can you shed light on some of the uh, opportunities for ODR that you're seeing very closely in businesses that you look at? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Sachin. Uh, I think at Omidya, we have been for almost a decade supporting entrepreneurship and technology uh, to really offer market-based solutions uh, for the Indian population. Uh, and of course, it goes without saying that, you know, we've all seen how businesses have successfully been disrupted by technology uh, with more uh, efficient and cheaper delivery of products and services. Uh, I think the flip side, though, is that the same efficiency for customers to purchase products and services, uh, we don't often see that when there is a dispute. Uh, in fact, it probably is worse because uh, quite often uh, when you uh, transact digitally, uh, the person at the other side is remote uh, and therefore to really you know, resolve your problem uh, for a customer uh, is hard. Uh, and customers are voting with their feet when they have product or service issues. Uh, and it has huge costs for businesses and customers. So I, I actually agree a lot with Amit that, uh, you know, really dispute resolution is more customer retention. Uh, it's really more a means to save costs, uh, grow customer confidence in businesses. Uh, and I think therefore, you know, to your question, I think one of the first adopters will naturally be businesses which are much more digital uh, because they already have infrastructure which can support easy move into dispute resolution. Uh, and I, I think particularly where there are large volumes, low value transactions, uh, you know, this can be really efficient. And uh, I'm really delighted with uh, RBI's uh, you know, recent announcement on ODR because during the pandemic, one of the things, for example, we noticed is that payment companies who are at, you know, the chain uh, really giving welfare benefits to people across the country, uh, they would have really been hugely benefited by having uh, a system which kind of highlighted where payments were failing, for instance. 
Well, you know, I would say the first uh, set of early adopters will be probably the financial sector, uh, even somewhat more offline businesses like banks and MBS. Um, and I think the reason for them to be early adopters of uh, ODR uh, is a, of course, uh, once the moratorium lifts, we might have more number of disputes flowing in. Uh, and these are also institutions which already have experience in ad hoc arbitration. Uh, also, a lot of banks have processes which enable them to quickly uh, integrate with ODR startups and get things going. So I think that's the first. Uh, the second point I'd like to make, uh, um, Sachin, is that globally we've seen uh, ODR can actually deliver scale in terms of dispute resolution. You have uh, eBay doing more than 60 million transactions a year, almost 90% of which uh, are actually about human interaction. Uh, and also time efficiency. I mean, I, I think you have a Brazilian example where uh, utility disputes are resolved in less than uh, five minutes. Uh, so I, I think, you know, that's the second point I'd like to make, that there is enormous saving in terms of time, uh, as well as efficiency at scale. Uh, let me conclude by talking a little bit about us as investors. Uh, I, I think uh, we are you know, quite delighted with the energy in this ecosystem. Uh, we see that there's a lot of entrepreneurship who's looking at are almost as a service, you know, software as a service product. And uh, we would be delighted to actually see how all of this takes shape whether businesses implement their own uh, dispute resolution mechanisms or they you know, choose to support um, ODR entrepreneurs who are offering SaaS services. So uh, really you know, look forward to seeing how this develops and being a part of this journey, Sachin. You know, Shilpa, I'm so glad you mentioned two things, uh, one of which I'm going to come back to you. But you mentioned two things that I find very useful to remember is the, exp is the experience of fairly similar jurisdictions like Brazil on the utility disputes. I feel that there's something we need to look at there because we're always looking to the US and Europe, but the experience of platforms like eConciliador and others on the utility disputes is remarkable because they've been able to bring down utility disputes that were going through the cycles for a year, year and a half into five minute, seven minute rule based resolutions. But of course, they, that requires a degree of, especially when it's public utility, a degree of uh, policy making and setting. But the impact has been huge, tremendous. And I hope that that's a conversation we can take forward, including uh, through the NITI platform because of how dramatic it can be. I think, uh, Shripa, one little follow up question for you is, Something you mentioned about the versatility of ODR, that you will see ODR that is native inside business inside businesses. You will see ODR that's an integration. You will see ODR that's a kind of a conversation between a third party provider. And so you'll see a very wide variety. Can you just, is there any other sector that you can point to where you say, let's look at this to see what ODR could look like in, in our space? Is there another sector that comes to your mind? Uh, you mean other than a uh, financial sector? Is that what you mean? Finance. In finance, are we seeing this kind of diversity of solutions depending upon the providers? Right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I would say, uh, you know, of course, within businesses itself, there's a, dif a distinction, let's say, between banks and NBFCs and payment companies. And, uh, you know, for both of them, uh, it might be a bit different. But, uh, you know, what's exciting to me, and let me take this as an example, uh, you know, the uh, let's let's take a welfare benefit payment that's being you know provided by let's say a business correspondent company, uh, and sometimes a person who's trying to access this he sees that you know the transaction doesn't work. Uh, there's really no knowledge in terms of which of you know the eight hops in that transaction has gone wrong, and therefore to me uh, you know the exciting part is. Uh, both at a you know the let's say the business correspondent level, whether it's the bank level, or whether even the central financial you know uh, backbone level, if there was availability of information to actually explain what was happening, you'd actually see much better you know customer acceptance and customer satisfaction. So I go back to saying it's a great uh, customer retention tool really.
Thank you, Sripa. That's uh, really insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Let me move to Karthikian. Karthikian capital float, the sector it's in, Sripa has already laid the foundations for, you know, where do you go from here? How are you looking at ODR? Uh, you know, uh, are, are there use cases that for you make obvious sense? I uh, would love to hear from you. Mr. Khan, uh, Justice Sri Krishna, CIA panelists, eminent lawyers and moderators, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to start with an hypothesis that we drew a few months back. The rate of growth of disputes arising out of online digital transactions is expected to outperform the rate of growth of the transactions itself, unless acted upon externally. Now I say this and uh, we started working on this for a for a while now but having said that there are two inherent reasons why we feel that this is the rate of disputes which are growing exponentially is is the way it is one reason why we think is because the gap between what we asked for and what we get is getting wider as we move from face to waste to digital transactions and the other significant reason that i see as why disputes would raise exponentially for a digital lender like us is the the transaction value getting smaller and smaller our existing redressal forums today are not designed to handle such small value transactions at such volumes let's face it we're not ready as yet as far as this is concerned there's something that always crosses my mind. When you can shop online, when you can take a loan online, and most recently when you can consult for a, uh, uh, for a, for a treatment online, why shouldn't you be able to resolve a dispute online? For us to, to you know, even look at ODR platform, some of the basic things that we look at for an ODR platform is for it to be accredited, a platform that can make it easy for filing and contesting a case. Flexibility in time is what customers look at today. Obviously, it has to be cost effective and something that can provide quick resolution. Let me close my comments by trying to predict what kind of disputes are the ones that we predict that will get into these kind of forums as we set this up. And I'm going to kind of narrow this down to the fintech lending part that we're part of. Disputes in lending are primarily two large sets. One being customers who do not have the ability to pay, and we call it credit risk. And the other one is anything outside of that. More often than not, disputes that originate from the other set, which is not from the ones that is ability to pay, is easily resolved over a, over a discussion. And that is the reason why we feel there is a need for ODIA. And that is the reason why we would want to make this intervention externally into our digital lending platform. Thank you, Kartikian. That was so well said. You know, uh, a friend from the digital economy always uses the example saying the digital economy, what's remarkable is it is much, much bigger and much, much smaller, right? <laughs> it's much, much bigger because the platforms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's much, much smaller because you, you have to do it in an hour. The loan is of uh, 1,000 rupees. You know, the delivery is of 30 minutes. And the dispute cannot be of 30 days or 45 days. It cannot. It cannot be framed in that way. Uh, nobody is going to wait. Uh, so it's a remarkable paradigm shift that forces innovation in a way that that's why I think one of the what Shilpa also mentioned about the variety of solutions, a challenge for the entrepreneurs. And I was the voice of entrepreneurs earlier in today's conversation, but a challenge for entrepreneurs is to design solutions for this frame. I think that's going to be uh, really any any kind of closing thoughts on that challenge. Whatever we, we kind of embark on and for a lack of a better word, if I can call it ODR 1.0, will not be exactly as we envisage it at this point in time. What's important for all of us as industrialists and as part of uh, the, the ecosystem 
is to be committed and to be and to stick around till the time this evolves and you know kind of wraps around it to the way we want it to be lovely thank you so much uh, let me come to uh, a voice of e-commerce in the country one of the original voices of e-commerce uh, and uh, you know just before it gets sort of trademarked by anybody i think snap deal should get snap dispute uh, because i'm sure that snap the snap dispute is going to be taken by somebody but smriti would love to hear from you uh, the voice of e-commerce uh, yeah how are you looking at odia i like i like snap this dude for sure uh, thank you for having me uh, i speak today of course odia has many applications uh, i i would like to speak about e-commerce in particular uh, e-commerce is we are all aware offers a new channel of trade and distribution it uh, disrupts the current uh, or the fast hegemony uh, what it does essentially to my mind is three things Uh, it provides access to market to manufacturers. It provides choice to consumers, and also uh, creates an open and more competitive marketplace. And all three of them are very important for uh, the macroeconomics of any country. And therefore, in an e-commerce growth, is not just a, a, a sector of e-commerce growing alone. It sort of grows an entire economy. while we are at very nascent stage so we commerce which is about uh, just about 10 years old in the country uh, the most difficult thing has been to encourage adoption for this platform or this way of working and that is primarily because of the trust deficit that we have uh, i think odr as a solution which promises faster resolution Uh, which offers transparency in dispute resolution is absolutely necessary for creating that trust ecosystem. Um, while uh, having said that, uh, I also think there is another benefit of ODR going forward. To me, when you have a technology-powered ODR solution, over a period of time, I think it will help build a, a huge database of dispute. uh and litigants which will be extremely useful for law enforcement and the companies uh, to either review their own products or enforce uh, you know better better rules of the marketplace if i were to put it uh, just applying it to e-commerce e-commerce tends to have a problem not just uh, having deviant behaviors from the sellers but we also have deviant behaviors from buyers um, and over a period of time i hope a technology powered odr platform would create large amount of data which would help uh, identify such uh, deviant behaviors and preemptively help companies to uh, avoid conflicts by identifying these behaviors and As, as a preemptive measure so i don't see odr just as a dispute resolution uh, but i see it in future a uh, tool which will help companies to learn better and enforcement agencies to be able to have better enforcements you know uh, smriti what's really interesting about that is that even at the first meeting that happened on june 6th everyone was oriented towards how the the courts should open up their data but justice chandrachud in that mentioned something really interesting he said he wants to know the data from disputes from the companies so that the system can learn well in advance what is not working what needs to be mitigated and what needs to be dealt with at the last stage right. so i think that when we look at data we tend to see it as one way but i think it's going to be multiple sources of data and products getting smarter if that data is available you know i even see potentially data trusts where the, the sector as a whole can learn you know how to be better so thank you for flagging that point uh, smriti uh, any any thoughts on that of course i mean uh, when we were before uh, mr krishko palakrishnan's committee and then we were discussing npd one of the things that we spoke about is the benefit of sharing of information and specifically around disputes 
uh, between the companies, which could potentially create a central database of disputes uh, for companies and the government policymakers, regulators, enforcement agencies to really learn from. And uh, if you were trying to analyze uh, disputes within each different company um, in, in silos, I believe the data sets are too small uh, to actually apply a big data or an AI on them effectively. So creating large databases of information is very important if one is looking at AI or a big data applying to litigation or dispute resolutions in the future. Thank you so much, Smriti. And then Rahul Martin's going to smile, but data trusts are definitely going to be a future part of our ecosystem because private data sharing is going to come with its own uh, understanding and framework. Thank you, Smriti. I want to go to uh, uh, the General Council of a really dynamic organization growing very fast, Setu. Uh, Vinay Kesri, uh, how are you looking at ODR? How is Setu seeing the ODR opportunity? Right. Uh, no, thanks, Sachin. So uh, I'll be honest, I'm, uh, my title is general counsel, but I'm only half a lawyer now. Uh, my job is mostly to bridge uh, the tech and legal worlds. I, and, I can't uh, resist it, but are you general or are you counsel? <laughs> I think, I think the, you know, the, the balance between those shifts daily, to be completely honest. Uh, so, you know, at Setu, uh, you know, we build API platforms, uh, you know, for the financial services uh, landscape. And, you know, as an early employee there, I've really seen what it means to build, uh, you know, to think about building platform scale systems for uh, the financial services space. Now, uh, Shilpa Kumar from Omidyar and uh, Karthikeyan from Capital Float both talked about how uh, financial services is a very important candidate for ODR. Uh, financial services need to reach the real India. Right. The penetration of financial services is still extremely shallow in India. We need to shrink the ticket size of loans and other types of financial services. But this also means uh, that we will have very little value left over in the revenue pool to take care of disputes. Now, if you look at Western countries, loan ticket sizes are larger. The costs of payments, just your regular day-to-day -day payments, whether they're P2P or uh, payments to businesses, they are much, much higher. And, uh, you know, MDR for payments in the US can be, you know, as high as two or 3%. This leaves a large enough pool that you can build in, you know, insurance and other types of mechanisms that can either avoid or take care of eventual dispute scenarios. In India, it's very different. There's very little or often no revenue uh, left over to take care of these disputes. If you look at UPI, for example, UPI payments, which are currently the dominant form of uh, consumer payments, especially post COVID, uh, this has zero MDR, which leaves no revenue pool left over to really budget in, uh, you know, eventual dispute situations and who's going to take care of it and who's going to pay for the cost of resolving those disputes. So this leaves a very large vacuum where that all of us here need to fill. Now, we have an immense opportunity, I think, here to just reimagine the whole idea of dispute resolution. And we should not be constrained by what already exists. You know, Cyril Shroff said, don't create a CPC for online disputes. And I really cannot endorse that enough. I would go you know, beyond this as well and say, don't look at ODR as just taking dispute resolution online. I mean, that's the plain meaning of the words, but that's not the way we should really look at it. Uh, it's very different and it needs to be very, very focused. So we need to uh, focus on understanding what we need to achieve here. So, uh, you know, Purnima Sampath from Tata, Pramudra from ICICI, they talked about classifying disputes into categories. Uh, and I think that is a very important starting point here. We need to be very clear about the types of disputes that we want to deal with through ODR platforms. They are not a silver bullet. Uh, we cannot solve every kind of dispute through ODR. It is instead an extremely targeted solution for a very specific subset of disputes. That doesn't mean it cannot be powerful, but we have to be very clear about what it can address and what it cannot. Now, 
you know, given where I work, I have obviously been very immersed in the API, uh, you know, ecosystem. Uh, APIs that stands for application programming interfaces. They are basically a standardized way for two different systems to talk to each other, right? And uh, I think that we we can actually learn a lot from that. Now, the key point we need to dwell on here as resolution professionals is actually standardization. Now, right now, there is very, very little standardization in this case. The types of disputes possible, the pieces of evidence that need to be presented in order to resolve this dispute, the weightage given to them, the reasoning paths that are used to reach a conclusion. None of this is standardized. In order to create ODR mechanisms uh, that are you know, that can actually be used for these kinds of disputes, we need to create systems of standardization around all of these. Right? Uh, and the reason why I think financial services is a good way to, uh, to start this is because, well, financial services have, well, one, they're a huge, uh, you know, source of disputes. Uh, I don't have all of the figures, but I think that they are possibly the, you know, outside of government litigation, they are possibly the highest source of disputes. They are also relatively more easy to classify into, you know, specific categories and uh, resolution paths. So, uh, you know, I think for that reason, we should really think about, uh, you know, financial services as possibly the first, uh, you know, potentially area to apply these kinds of ODR mechanisms. And finally, I also think that we don't need to reinvent the wheel here because the fact is whether we see it this way or not, we already have a live example of a basic ODR mechanism in the financial services space, UPI, dominant form of consumer payments. It already has a dispute resolution API baked into the specifications. Today, if you use a UPI app, let's say Google Pay or Phone Pay or Paytm, uh, and if you have a UPI related payments dispute, you can register that dispute through your app's interface, and this will be transmitted to your bank. It doesn't matter whether this bank is, uh, has any kind of an agreement or relationship with Google Pay or Phone Pay or Paytm or whoever your UPI app is. They can be completely unrelated. But as long as your bank is on UPI and you're able to use it through the UPI system, you can register this dispute. And if this dispute is related to something, uh, you know, which is within the purview of your bank, this dispute will reach your bank because your bank has implemented the UPI API specifications. Right? And it's part of the UPI system. So this is the beauty of APIs. They promote this kind of interoperability at very, very low cost. Now, the other advantage of interoperable APIs is that you can create uh, a competitive ecosystem. Nobody wants just one ODR provider. Just like no one wants only one lawyer. Nobody wants. You want choice. Right? With APIs, you can make sure that you have a vibrant ecosystem of ODR providers. As long as there is some level of standardization through APIs, uh, you know, the, the lenders or the payment companies, consumers as well, will all have choice as long as there is some level of standardization. And we are able, through the standardization, we're able to create a vibrant ecosystem of ODR providers. So Sachin, you know, you were talking about, you know, a lot of startups that are building ODR mechanisms. I don't think that any single one of them should be the winner. We need to have an ecosystem where there are multiple ODR providers and people should be able to choose which ODR provider they want to use. Now, uh, of course, this isn't limited just to financial services. Uh, in the past, there have also been efforts to, uh, you know, try uh, to standardize telecom disputes. There was even an API spec that was written to actually cover most of the dominant types of uh, telecom disputes. This formula can basically be applied to any sector where there is enough data to understand the dominant types of disputes and where there are uh, digital platforms where interoperable systems and APIs can be implemented. And finally, I'll just end with this, uh, you know, ODR is not a solution to all types of disputes. It's a way to take care of certain kinds of disputes that usually never make it to the court system either because it's not cost effective to do it or because uh, it's just not practical for some other reason. And this usually becomes a sunk cost or some kind of a negative externality in that system, which becomes shared across all participants and becomes an additional cost in that system. 
with odr we can perhaps find ways to uh, to remove those kinds of negative externalities and i think that's the right way to look at this thank you so much vinay i hope the 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 odr startups were listening because that was quite a class in product design and the uh, product opportunities that exist we are we are really running up on time so i'm going to come for the closing comment to the i think the perfect closing comment which is rakesh verma of payment products <laughs> at alliance you know after vinay uh, spoke about upi uh, rakesh would love to get your closing comments on uh, this panel on the odr opportunity you're seeing okay uh first of all thank you so much sachin and thank you uh for me to have uh, been part of this particular discussion uh see uh while i think uh, we we recently saw two days back the reserve bank of india came out with uh, the guidelines for implementing an online dispute resolution mechanism for the payment uh, ecosystem or the payments industry my submission would be look if we we while we designing uh, any such payment system uh, for a country like india and let us not just be specific about the payment ecosystem it could be about any any industry i'm talking about uh, when we design an online dispute resolution ecosystem and considering the fact that india is a very vast country both uh, geographically as well as culturally one of the important points which needs to be taken care is that uh, whenever let's say a person logs on to the system for or you can say uh, registering a dispute i think that care should be taken to provide the interfaces in or you can say the uh, multiple languages or it has to have been a multilingual uh, interface has to be provided because i have seen personally that the moment you provide an interface in a language which is something closer to the person he he immediately tries to like sort of draw a very very uh, what you can say uh, comfort in lodging and explaining his situation so i think as a as a uh, uh, my thoughts on whichever industry develops the online dispute resolution mechanism i would suggest that uh, this should be taken care of uh, from both the geographical and cultural point of view and uh, i think enough language options should be provided to the uh, people who are going to use it i think that's really great you know uh, we if we forget how critical it is to localize because trust is a factor because the feeling of confidence is a factor if we begin by something that looks uh, untrustworthy then you know i don't think it's really going to go anywhere thank you for flagging that rakesh as, especially as an organization that is designing for you know several a billion indians i'm sure that language and loca localization is critical thank you rakesh we i would have come to you for a cl closing comment but we are at time and i really do want to invite a uh, hand over to uh, the next uh, uh, presentation uh, someone who we a uh, rare combination of uh, entrepreneur uh, public intellectual and very much a nation building uh, mindset uh, manish sabarwal manish is the chairman and co-founder of uh, team lease india's largest staffing and human capital firm uh, manish also serves on various state and central government committees on education employment and employability and is a columnist uh, for the indian express and economic times i know that during the lockdown many of us have turned to him for critical insights on really what is going on because it has been very slippery to know what is going on <laughs> and manish has often gone straight to the numbers and says this is what is going on you know he don't have to look left and right you don't have to have my view epid be epidemiologist or or the virologist i can just tell you here are the numbers so it's going on so manish thank you Uh, we want to uh, invite you to speak, Manish, about the digitization of critical public systems such as justice, and of course, uh, challenges on upskilling to make sure that we can build this conflict and dispute resolution capability in the country. Manish, over to you. Thanks, Sachin. Um, am I audible? It's fine. You can hear me. Yeah. So it's wonderful to hear the sessions before me. You know, for somebody who's you know hired somebody every five minutes for the last fifteen years, you can imagine I have one hundred and fifty guys in regulatory affairs, and I have a thousand court cases and labor law sort of cases against me personally. So um, obviously, something like this would really be amazing if it was possible, doable, and sort of um, legitimate in my mind. So, uh, so I'll sort of. You know, think about uh, talk about the two things. One is the sort of digitization, and the other is the skills, which is really more home turf for me. But I was really intrigued by this this sort of initiative of yours because 
in so many areas the lockdown i'm i'm a little surprised by everybody's outrage <laughs> at how msmes have behaved or how migrants have behaved or how banks are behaving because these are all sort of pre-existing conditions of indian economy and society right and and so because i think we are banging against the sins of omission rather than the sins of commission you know what we don't do is now becoming more important than what we do wrong and I think we have always sort of defined reform as sort of fixing what we are doing wrong, while I, at least I am now banging against the reform, the sort of challenges of what we don't do. And COVID sort of sets off a digitization super cycle, partly because of just the mandatory digital literacy course for everybody on the planet or country, right? Irrespective of caste, creed, age, education, everybody has been subject to a mandatory digital literacy course. And we see the first signs of that, obviously, in um, shopping and in education. I start have now started seeing it in even in um, sort of medicine. But it would absolutely be wonderful if this could impact justice. And, and justice purely from my narrow perspective would be 67,000 compliances, 8,000 filings, and 8,000 changes to that every year, right, for employer compliances. And I know you know, people at Niti Aayog have been championing ease of doing business, but from my perspective, um, these 67,000 compliances and 8,000 filings a year are are completely um, unfair to employers. And most importantly, 8,000 of them prescribed jail, right? <laughs> you know, out of the 67,000 compliances. You know, one of my one of the interesting lines in the Vishnu Sahasranam roughly translates to "Why did God create fear?" So he could take it away, right? <laughs> you know, so basically, these 8,000 criminalization of normal compliances are basically ways to create corruption, at least from my perspective. So, I think the digitization of this ecosystem just of employer compliances would itself be uh, really benefit from obviously online dispute regulation. But let me try the more difficult job here of trying to convert this into what are the implications for skills or what are the implications for jobs and really the human capital world that I sort of inhabit. Now it's, it's always hard to in India to sort of estimate employment elasticity of anything, right? Does demand create its own supply? I mean, if you create skills, will you create jobs or do you first create the jobs and skills? I mean, the chicken and egg problem is always sort of inherent in everything in India, right? And the only way to solve a chicken and egg problem is to become vegetarian, you know, try something completely different. And I, and I think what you're talking about here, at least from my perspective, is a little bit like what happened in bankruptcy, right? I mean, if you think of bankruptcy as an industry now that is being born or created in front of our own eyes, um, out of the thousand bankruptcy professionals, most of them are chartered accountants and company secretaries who have repaired or upgraded themselves. So, so if we say that there are six and a half lawyers in India, if we say that there are about two and a half lakh chartered accountants in India, how many of them are working is a question, right? Um, you know. 24% of the women with a medical degree in India aren't working. And I think they aren't working for reasons that um, are very interesting from your perspective, because online dispute regulation will bring labor market outsiders into the labor force, right? People who prefer flexibility, people who prefer the gig economy and can't commute or, or various reasons. So, so if you were to think about, and, and this is obviously something that you guys have worked on, but the three categories of arbitration professionals, which already exist, but there obviously could be sort of resolution professionals. And then you guys have sort of come up with the whole program manager professional, right? And and would all this be repair, prepare, and upgrade of the existing six and a half lawyers or two and a half lakh chartered accountants? Or would this sort of be a new category of professionals? And I think the answer to that doesn't really matter. I think that if you think of any skill system, there are three legs of the skill systems. There's certification, there's delivery, and there's sort of financing. I think that certification, um, we will have to be careful. I don't think we want to do it too early. Um, as in, I think that any certification has to get the balance of the entry gate and the exit gate right, right? You know, IITs have tight entry gates, but wide open exit gates. ITIs have wide open and wide open. Um, well, the chartered accountant exam has wide open entry gate and tight exit gate. 
vocational training in India has wide open entry gate and wide open exit gate. Therefore, it didn't have signaling value, right? So as you are creating this industry, I would urge caution about thinking about certification, but don't worry about that too much. You know, driving licenses weren't issued till, you know, 10 years after cars or 20 years after cars were invented. And that's probably why it became universal. So, so certification would be one thing that you would have to think about. Don't do premature load bearing, but don't wait too long. I am, and don't get the balance. Don't become like ITIs with wide open entry gates and wide open exit gates. You know, so you have to think about that because if you lose the signaling value of a profession, it's very hard to recover. And too many professions in India have devalued certification. I think that from a delivery perspective, in the repair, prepare, and upgrade continuum that I think of, um, you know, upgrade only works where there is a motivated learner. Um, repair uh, uh, works whether the sort of distance or, or the time taken for repair and the cost for repairs in that high. I don't think we can prepare resolution professionals. So our first opening balance will be people who are already lawyers, people who are already chartered accountants, people who are already company secretaries. And anyway, that population is more than enough for, say, the one lakh uh, resolution professionals we want and maybe the 10,000 program managers sort of what we want. But I think the question here is also of financing, right? Whenever you want to create a new profession, who's going to pay for skill development is really important. And I think in India, we have missed the whole question of financing skill development because there is a market failure in skill development, right? Em employers are not willing to pay for candidates or for training, but they're willing to pay a premium for trained candidates. Candidates are not willing to pay for training. They're willing to pay for a job. Banks or microfinance aren't willing to lend to the candidate unless a job is guaranteed and training companies are unable to fill up their classrooms. But again, in your case, where I would submit that the first one lakh resolution professionals would come from the existing pool of people we have, again, the financing and the certification question may not be as important as the place where I operate, right? The fastest growing segment of India's job market is sales, customer service, and logistics. And there, this question becomes tricky. So I would submit that if you were to say that there are 1.3 million cases filed every month and 10 times those number of cases, as you have suggested in some of your research, are people who don't go to law or don't get expert advice, I think that the one lakh number for resolution professionals is way underestimated. Um, I think this number could be, um, you know, much higher than one lakh that we need and 10,000 program managers. The question is, um, does the existing profession have an antibiotic reaction to this? I mean, do they do they feel that, oh my God, I, I you know, repair and sort of upgrade in old age are, are too high expectations from lawyers. We already know what we, we're doing and, and we're not going to sort of adopt it. Um, I mean, that would be their problem. This is going to happen anyway, just like we saw happening with bankruptcy professionals. I think that that is a profession which is being created in our eyes. There are only 1,000 of them. Um, and obviously, we've had the goofy characters in those 1,000 people who are now being weeded out, as you will have when you create any new profession. But I would say that, you know, you will never be a huge number of jobs, right? I don't think you're even aiming for that. But, you know, it's back to my sort of case to the profession that, um, India doesn't have a jobs problem, we have a wages problem, right? <laughs> so it's like IT in India. IT is only 0.7% of India's labor force, but it's 7% of GDP. So it's an oasis of high productivity. And I think your online dispute resolution professionals could get created at a much faster pace than any other profession we've seen in India because of the digitalization super cycle because of the clear addressable market, which might be whatever, 14, 15 million, you could think of it every month. And because you have to start with existing professionals in the industry. So the two and a half lakh chartered accountants, the four, four and a half, five lakh lawyers. And I would submit out of the two and a half lakh chartered accountants, only 1.25 lakh are practicing chartered accountants. And that's like I said, you know, 26% of women in India with a medical degree are not practicing as doctors. And so online dispute resolution to me is also part of a very big thing in India that we have to work on is how do we get labor market outsiders back into the labor force? 
And I would say that you've got so many other lawyers who would love the flexibility and love the sort of portfolio life, or I don't want to call it gig economy, but that's probably what it is. So I think that you're on a wonderful cusp of not only solving something like people like us. As I mentioned, I have 150 guys in compliance and I have 1,000 labor law court cases because you can't comply with 100% of India's labor laws without violating 10% of them. <laughs> so let's just be clear that it, you know most of India's court cases, are, there are 17 definitions of workers, there are 21 definitions of wages, and there are 19 definitions of enterprises. So this, at, as, and, I, and it was surprising to me how many of your prior panelists mentioned employment law as an area where online dispute resolution could work really well. I actually think it should be your your sort of bony <laughs> should be employment law, right? Because the for, the way place where you get started, um, if you get started in employment law, it would really not only be see labor laws are not pro labor and they're not pro employer. They are pro bureaucrat and pro labor inspector today. So actually, the, the, the way that they are written actually doesn't protect our labor and doesn't prevent employers who want to violate it. But it does really make life easy for the labor inspector. And so when there are two consenting adults between an employer and an employee, I would submit that um, your online dispute resolution in employment law could be a hit um, just going off the bat. Um, because that's really built for it. But I think it's a wonderful opportunity. I think that one lakh, two lakh, three lakh sort of repair, prepare and upgrade is a, is a continuum. But in the repair and upgrade, I, I, I looked at many of the companies who are sort of thinking about the online and you already have a number of existing companies who are providing this sort of ed tech. So I think that you guys will hit the ground running. But um, I think, you know, it, it wasn't God's will that it should take 72 years for 1.3 billion Indians to cross the GDP of 66 million Britishers. One of the reasons is the inequality of justice, the delay in justice, and just sort of the breeding of, of the 40 million court cases. And so I think that you're on to something really big. So good luck and Godspeed. Thank you so much, Manish. And it's uh, before I hand over to Desh, it's really interesting that this conversation has been bookended by two interesting points, right? Like seem counterintuitive. Pramod starting off with uh, Pramod, uh, the general counsel of ICICI Bank, starting off by saying, don't regulate too early. And Manish ending by saying, don't certify too early. <laughs> it's some, something about uh, the entrepreneurial lens that we must recognize when you're building a momentum and a movement. Thank you so much, Manish. I'll hand over to Desh from Niti Aayog for the last two presentations of the day. Thank you. On what is a fantastic conversation about upscaling in technology uh, for ODR. Now we're getting to a to a really good presentation that I think all of us are looking forward to. It's on the adoption of technology in the post-pandemic world for online dispute resolution. And making that presentation uh, are Deep Kalra, CEO of Make My Trip, and Sanjay Mohan, who is the CTO of uh, Make My Trip, who together will talk about the potential for ODR uh, in the post pandemic world. So I'll hand over to them, please. Yeah, just give me a second to share the slides. Sure. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this, uh, I think, really interesting conference and really interesting topic. Uh, thanks, Amitabhji, for kicking it off. Uh, you know, I've been learning a lot about ODR, I have to confess, over the last week or so, and it's fascinating. And uh, many of the comments made today actually have convinced me that if there were ever a solution which was made for India, or a technology problem which was ever made for India, then it is ODR. And the reason is because, like I think uh, uh, Cyril and a few other people said, we have more supply and we have more cases and more data than probably any other country. We have, therefore, the biggest problem to solve. And on the other side, we have such a huge backlog with the courts. Uh, and finally, the most important part of the component, I really think, is, again, what people have said before, we have the minds, we have the know-how. If we can do this in other parts of the world, uh, why can't we do this for this self, for ourselves? So really, I believe it's a no-brainer uh, that we should be building this, whether we build it in what is Amitabh's, I think, uh, very well-proven, uh, successful model of a PPP, 
uh, or privately remains to be seen. Uh, I think it should be open for all, uh, but we should get into it. And the other very interesting part of this is that it fits in so beautifully into the India stack, which Sanjay, uh, our CTO, will talk about a little later about how this we can actually leverage the India stack, uh, which has already been built specifically on the data side. Uh, we'll just we just have a bunch, few slides and we won't exceed our time limit, so we'll just get into them without much ado. So why ODR I think has been con has been conveyed well, but I've been asked to look at it from the business point of view. So what I did was I actually looked at not only our own numbers, but I spoke to four other companies in the online space. Uh, friends who said, okay, don't quote us separately, but uh, you can give kind of uh, overall average numbers. So on the average, these four companies, as well as ourselves, we send about 1500 cases uh, get into court. Uh, these are customer cases typically a year. And the cost per case fairly conser conservatively is about 20,000. So here, straight off, straight off the bat, we're talking about three crores being spent there by just these, uh, by, by one of these companies. So for the whole sector, we easily run into hundreds of crores uh, if you look at it. The other space, and in the slides that follow, we'll actually see in the spectrum that on the other space, we also have within the company uh, how disputes can be nipped early in the bud if a rule-based system can be built. And we'll talk about that. And there, the savings can go up to 0.2% of GMV, we believe, uh, possibly even go to 50 crores or more. So staggering numbers for large companies, definitely uh, an imperative that we have to look at. COVID, if anything, has only made it even more critical. Uh, most of our courts are only working to 15, 20% capacity. The cost implications are even more serious now. And obviously, being contactless is very important. Uh, moving on, just so if we were to envisage an ODR spectrum or a kind of, it's not really a two by two matrix, it's almost like a five by three matrix. But there are just few things I want to call out out here. And the fundamental thing is, if you look at the y-axis, we are looking at uh, the volume. So if you look at the volume of cases or the volume of information, obviously the maximum amount that we have is right up front in the phase or the stage where we are still evaluating this dispute largely internally. If you go to the green box, what I'm talking about is here, we can actually focus on avoidance within the firm, again, based on a specific data processes, rule-based system can be built in. When you move to stage two or tier two, as we call it in the mediation, that is where the problem diagnosis moves to a party-to-party -party negotiation, uh, how we monitor that, as well as case management. And again, here we believe that facilitated ADR and hearing prep, et cetera, can also has a scope for tech play. The third and the final phase is around adjudication uh, and post-resolution support. If you just look at the gray uh, focus areas of technology, you will see that fundamentally upfront tech has a huge play and tech can actually take most of the heavy lifting out here. However, as we go onwards, then that is when human facilitators, perhaps geek workers, perhaps so many other people uh, we talked about who are very uh, competent, relevant and have the time, perhaps just retired people uh, not just judges, but other people who are experts in their domain and experts in their center in their particular areas can be built in out here. Uh, we'll just move on. What we believe in this whole uh, kind of ecosystem of ODR, the handshake plays a very critical role. The handshake is between the firm on one side or the company on one side and mediation adjudication on the other side. And we think the key elements of the handshake out here are around trust. So very trusted interface. I think that becomes super critical. If you can't trust the system, uh, then you know you probably won't go for this option. And I think this has been echoed by others. We believe permission, especially with data privacy now becoming so much more important, has become critical. You have to give the relevant data, but at the same time, safeguarding the uh, privacy of the individual. And this has to be permission, which is important. We believe there's a collaborative uh, kind of framework out here, which will be built. Well, we call it a virtual courtroom. Uh, you can have chat, you can have various other things, but how we will work on that, the workflow itself that's required for this, we have some thoughts on that. And finally, we also think that archivability and searchability of cases becomes very critical. So as the system is self-learning, and I think Amitabh put it beautifully, that if you don't build this with AI and ML, 
uh, then uh, you know this this is going to be a static system. So we make it a dynamic system, but you are also able to archive very quickly what's happened in the past and throw up the relevant options. Someone had said earlier, and people can actually get far more informed about what are my rights. I think Amit made that point earlier on, and it was a very relevant point. Uh, we will move on to the actual technology now. Uh, we have just about uh, three slides on that, which I'll request Sanjay because he's definitely more qualified to talk about this. We have been warned by Sachin uh, to only go to snorkeling level and not scuba dive to the bottom of the ocean on technology. Uh, so over to you, Sanjay. Thanks, Deep. And hello, everyone. So uh, this is what I'm showing you on this slide. Uh, typically, this is one representation from what we do within Make My Trip, at least. And I think this is not something that other companies might not be doing. It's very representative of almost all the companies would be doing on the avoidance part, at least on, on the left hand side. And what is important again is, I mean, and, and the key takeaway for other companies and how, how do we ready all of India to move towards ODR, first of all, you have to democratize the data. And that is what we show you on the left hand side, which you have all kinds of, and this is with respect to what we do in travel. You have all the bookings and then you have the customer interaction logs. What hotels did you look at? What flights did you book? What, what, what discounts and what bank cards did you enter? And all, all kinds of interaction logs that, that we capture during the buying funnel. And then you have supplier interaction logs at the time of booking the flight or at the time of booking the hotel, what promises were made to you. So we capture all of that. So there's a lot of stuff that the customer clicks on and a lot of stuff that the supplier commits to give to the customer. All of that is captured. And I think from an ODI perspective, the transparency of data has to be supreme. I mean, that's probably the most important thing here. So as we ready ourselves for ODR, this is something that has to be democratized and made available. Now, Deep talked about the privacy aspect also. So within the company, there's no concerns because obviously there's a lot more data that you have and you can do a lot more processing and a lot more intelligence within the company. And that is where the avoidance and the containment part. So minimize the number of cases really leaking out of the system and getting out of the, out of the codes. Then after that, you have this entire AI ML model and Amitabh also talked about that and Deep referred to this as well. And almost all of you have made a mention that there have to be AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning models that will pick up all the raw data, uh, refine it a little bit, and then have trusted insights. And trusted insights come from all kinds of aggregated UGC. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this that later. Uh, but then based on all of that, it flows into a problem diagnosis phase and then you have a dispute resolution. Internally within the company, we do have, I think all the e-commerce companies, at least they have a customer delight team. And uh, if the software itself cannot resolve, then the, then a person comes into, into uh, they, they get involved and then they, the person would resolve the dispute. That feedback has to go back into the model again. So that's a, that's the learning loop because machine can only do so much on the avoidance part. Most of the avoidance that companies do typically right now and payment is a huge, uh, it's, it's a great example of that, that you make a lot of things transparent to the user. I mean, half of the cases come to four because the customer is anxious and they don't have the full information. So the, the avoidance part, at least if you can get all the relevant information out to the customers, half of the problem is solved right there. And, uh, so machines can solve a lot of those issues. And then there's this learning and feedback loop that comes into the model. On the trust part again, uh, as a customer, if I have concerns that I'm really being faced, even, even in this process, how do you build trust with the customers? And the only way to build trust is to have aggregated customer satisfaction scores. So if I tell you that for a case like this, 80% of the customers got a remuneration or a compensation, which was which is something like this uh, at least as a customer you could feel that okay they are not facing me because most of the customers have gotten similar treatment and they've been happy with it so a lot of ugc and a lot of crowdsourcing can happen to build the trust it doesn't have to happen uh, you don't have to have any trusted agency outside but just sheer numbers and the crowdsourcing part will build the trust in the system itself so uh, 
so this is all that we can do within the company and think uh, rating india for odr i think if all the companies start democratizing their data uh, that will help a lot i'll give this one slide probably to deep you want to talk about it or do you want me to just move through no keep going on i think time is yeah, short so we've looked at a few of the models I, I won't read it out but almost all the countries i mean modria came up earlier also and uh, so that came out of a uh, of ebay and paypal and uh, it's a tech driven platform uh, most of you are aware of that platform already netherlands has a model for diverse settlement uh, China has been experimenting with a few hybrid models. There are some models where the, the complainants have to go to a, a physical location, which is marked as an internet courthouse. Uh, in other cases, you can stay at home and uh, do the conflict resolution, the dispute resolution. So all countries, to some extent, they have they are experimenting with some models uh, in specific areas, some are some in MSME, some for the dispute for cross-border transactions in EU. EU. Uh, and uh, Sachin talked about the stuff that is happening within India as well. Uh, uh, several startups are doing this. So, if we had to solve this problem from a tech, from a pure technology lens, and uh, starting from scratch, and I'm taking the luxury for being a bit naive here. Uh, not putting the current context of what what all has happened, but if we had to solve it at India scale, uh, it has to be a, a federated, multi-tiered federated architecture. Call it a hub and spoke model, if you will. But the thing that you see in black in the center, that is the central agency for dispute resolution. That could be a consumer forum or courts. That could be at the national level, and in within that, I have listed a lot of things which could fall and within the india stack probably or use elements from the india stack i mean uh, uh, sachin made a reference to dispute databases and data trust that can be built on top of the dg logger for instance and because that is where all the private information can be stored based on your Aadhaar id so uh, it could be done that and the API interface falls in the resolutions can can be handed over there so it's fits probably very nicely with some of the elements, some of the components of the India stack. Trust I talked about already, uh, transparency of data. Now the data format again, there has to be a standard mechanism of doing searchability across the cases. Uh, so data formats also, the interfaces, uh, when I talked about the API and the standardization of interfaces, I think all of that within the workflow and the interfaces, I think that standardization has to happen. So you can create a ticket, track a ticket, uh, search a ticket for a particular case, just have a, a free text search of how, how to resolve a particular issue. And that could basically fan out into one of the specific domain searches and it will get, get you the results that you need. So that is fundamentally what we are proposing at India level if we have to solve it because some of the last tiers, the tier two that I'm talking about, that could be online, it could be offline. As long as you have the same interfaces of data going out and the resolution of the insights coming into the system, I think this model should work beautifully because you are basically distributing the responsibilities all across. So this is what we had. Deep, you want to have the final words? What is it said? And I think uh, it's a great, great effort uh, once again from Niti Aayog and uh, Agami and Omidya. And we are very happy to be helpful in any way uh, that's that's required. Uh, we would love to play a part. We've just come out of one other very nice PPP model working. Actually, wouldn't have seen the light of day without Amitabh Khan. That was Arugya Seto. So look forward to the next one if we can play a role. Thank you. They show it to you. presentation would have loved to discuss it at great length unfortunately we are a little short on time so uh, without further ado we are going to uh, ask mr sanjeev bajaj vice president cii and chairman and managing director of bajaj finance to make the valedictory address sir thank you 
श्री अमिताभ कांत जी जस्टिस श्री कृष्ण आई कैन सी दैट ही इज प्रॉब्ली स्टिल देयर लेडीज जर्मन गुड आफ्टरनून एट द आउटसाइड आई एम हैप्पी टू बी पार्ट ऑफ दिस व्हाट्स बीन अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग वेबिनार ओवर द लास्ट फ्यू आवर्स एस सी आई आई वी वुड लाइक टू थैंक नीति आयोग फॉर को होस्टिंग दिस with agami and uh, omudia network over here uh, on a very topical issue i would say uh, on promoting the odr mechanism now we know that the ease of doing business has been a very significant uh, priority of this government for the last few years and with a number of initiatives taken our india india's rank in doing business uh, ranking of the world bank has registered a significant jump by 79 points from 142nd to 63rd position in 2020 and while our country is on an upward growth trajectory for many indicators of doing business and that's important if we have to attract uh, uh, more and more capital domestic and international over here but one of the areas where clearly there is scope for improvement is in enforcing contracts um because our country ranks only at a 130 uh, 163rd position in this uh, for many reasons including the amount of time it takes in dispute resolution the limited number of commercial courts lack of specialized judges inadequate court infrastructure and a yet incoming or a growing mechanism for alternate dispute resolution in addition we know and uh, people have talked about the current pandemic that we are going uh, through it's very clear that this is going to result in a, another whole set of new cases that are going to come up uh, due to business stoppages delayed payments and this is going to further burden our courts and the system in general it is hence inevitable in these times that a transformational change in how we conceptualize the interaction between citizens the industry the legal fraternity and the judiciary uh, is required to expedite the dispute resolution process besides revamping the conventional means of the legal system which also is required we do need to play impo uh, place importance on the innovative ways of odr now we know in the past adr mechanisms has helped the judiciary to dispose of a plethora of cases which otherwise would have come to them but the impact of adr and we've heard about this uh, over the last few hours can be multiplied if it is coupled naturally with technology and that is why it is exceedingly important to leverage odr uh, in our country unlock its true potential and to enable resolution of disputes in a collaborative and online environment we at cii are clear that odr is a very important pillar of the future of justice which together brings mediation arbitration and negotiation and very often an amalgamation of the three and allows disputing parties to decide how they want their disputes to be handled to implement odr nationally we need proactive efforts by the government the judiciary lawyers and litigants so that we together create an ecosystem that's conducive for online dispute resolution now we've seen a lot of suggestions ideas of uh, in the various sessions and there are a few that i would like to stress on as well first safeguards must be introduced to ensure confidentiality of our proceedings of data and documents while resolving the disputes through the odr mechanism this is of course essential to maintain confidence of all parties in uh, virtually running this process it's also crucial to find the right solutions to increasing challenges of cyber security and data privacy and and we all know that as the use of data gets more and more widespread in odr 
it will create its own intelligence source for future resolution of cases as well. Second point, the ODR mechanisms have to be made available at an economic cost, especially for MSMEs. And MSMEs are our largest base in CII. Now, this is an age old debate, especially where you have startups involved. Um, do you get the volume first or do you cut price to get the volume? And I believe keeping in mind the long time opportunity and need for ODR in our country, we have to see upfront that the mechanisms, the whole process has to be cost competitive with our traditional ones. Third, the government should help to make available a basic digital infrastructure for a robust ODR mechanism. For example, just internet, good quality internet, which is now everywhere, it's available everywhere, but as uh, Justice, Justice Sri Krishna was saying in the beginning, very often it, it gets cut off or you can't see people or hear people clearly. You can't have that happening. Creating virtual data rooms, the right video conferencing platforms, transcription, translation services, and the appropriate hardware all together will make this process that much more smoother. Last, the necessary laws must be put in place to ensure that the awards announced on virtual platforms are adhered to at the grassroots level and the cases don't get reallocated to the conventional judicial system. Uh, somebody mentioned that earlier as well, that we have to make sure that once the decision is taken, it is disposed, it will go off. And we do know that many cases that will come to ODR will be the type which will be the small value cases where both parties want them uh, addressed, get done with, so they can get back to their normal lives. Further, while implementation of these measures will be pivotal in revamping the judicial system, we must also see that there is scope for learning from other countries in this sphere. For instance, uh, the government of Hong Kong established the COVID-19 ODR scheme to provide speedy and cost-effective services to businesses, in particular to MSMEs in these times. The International Center for Dispute Resolution, the Singapore International Arbit Center, and others have also recently issued guidance to facilitate remote participation in hearings through video conferencing. So there are many places that we can learn from. We know ODR in India is in its infancy and we should learn from best practices wherever it's available. CII stands shoulder to shoulder with the government to ensure greater reliance on ODR. We are contemplating setting up a CII center for alternate dispute resolution and promote the center as a hub for national and international arbitration and a preferred destination for ADR for the, for the industry. Further, through this center, CII will impart training, undertake uh, research, have various interactions, seminars, and conferences, and interact with various national and international arbitration forums to promote ADR, and then uh, using, and the, using technology, really take this to ODR, and that's what we've been discussing. Going forward, we look forward to continued engagement with all relevant stakeholders, including the government, the legal fraternity, and academia for improving India's performance in dispute resolution with the key objective of attracting international trade and foreign investment to achieve our collective goal of Atmanirbhar Bharat. Thank you. address uh, especially encouraging is uh, is the plan that's that you just shared about cii contemplating a, a center for arbitration uh, and dispute resolution which could actually go a long way towards institutionalizing and bringing a lot of stakeholders on board and thank you for offering your support to the to the government and to the ecosystem as a whole uh, i would just like to quickly uh, take this opportunity to thank 
uh, CII for co-hosting this event with us uh, and would like to thank the teams that were involved in the entire process. I would like to uh, I would also like to thank the teams from Agami and Omidia Network India, along with our internal team at Niti for putting together a, a, a session and convening which was absolutely uh, vital for the ODR movement as uh, Sachin had mentioned during his presentation as well. So I would just uh, like to go back to one brief session that we were supposed to uh, have prior to uh, prior to the last two sessions, but because in the interest of time, we had to uh, push it towards the end. I would just like to ask Bharat uh, if he would like to come in on a short conversation just to talk about the way ahead for uh, ODR and what we are planning. But thank you again, Mr. Bajaj, uh, for, for an absolutely outstanding uh, valedictory address. Thank you. So, thanks so much, Desh. Uh, yeah, we, we, we thought we'd, uh, we'd close today's session just by talking a little bit about uh, next steps and, and some of the elements of what. Begin that, Desh, just by talking about something that Mr. Kant mentioned right up front. Uh, he talked about this committee that Niti Aayog was setting up to sort of deliberate about uh, steps in the ODR journey and what can be done within, uh, within the government, what's being planned to be done within the government. So I wanted to ask you about that and, and if you could uh, sort of share your thoughts on, on what it is that that committee will be focusing on and what you're expecting or hoping that the committee will achieve. Uh, no, Bharat, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, as, as Mr. Khan had mentioned right, right at the top that uh, committee has been constituted under the chairmanship of uh, Justice A.K. Sikri, uh, former Supreme Court judge. So, I think some of the common threads that we are seeing in, the, in this entire ODR movement, uh, one of the most prevalent aspects of ODR is the consensus. And I think consensus building is what's going to determine how successful ODR is going forward. So the key takeaways that, or I would even say the specific words that stood out today during the various sessions, during the presentations, etc. Consensus, trust, integrity, transfer, transformation, uh, the absence of bias and finality. And I think all of those are aspects that play into the entire ODR revolution that we're looking at. And when we're looking at the terms of reference for this particular committee, I think uh, as Justice Sri Krishna alluded to at the right at the start, it's not a question of creating a specific framework. It's a question of enabling and kind of creating an ecosystem that is conducive to the entire landscape of stakeholders being active participants, taking the lead in their individual capacities and making sure that we can make online dispute resolution uh, a point of first contact for dispute avoidance and dispute containment, which is why rather than segregate specific aspects or specific matters, what we'd like to say is that this is the framework and this is the overall support that we're keen to provide. And as you heard Mr. Kant talking about the support that the ODR movement will get from, um, from the government and all the relevant stakeholders, I think one aspect you would see is that we want to encourage everyone to take the lead. I think that's the message which is key in this entire process. No, that's wonderful, Desh. I think uh, sort of this, this theme of providing the enabling environment and, and then uh, allowing for, for people to take the lead sounds like it's exactly right because uh, I think we, we heard a number of uh, sort of really interesting applications of, of ODR across today's uh, discussion, whether it was in areas like labor or consumer disputes or, or uh, disputes with, with business partners or other channel partners. Uh, sounds like an, an amazing amount of innovation and, and thinking that's already starting to go into uh, what ODR can do for about you know sort of what can enable uh, adoption even further uh, i think as uh, as they issue and you're not something brainstorming along with agami and, and other people uh, i think the, this thought for uh, for people who are still on the fence or who still don't know what odr is and what it can do for them uh, what resources can we bring to uh, bring to bear to to help them get up the learning curve and, and help them understand what the, the biggest applications are and, and that's where uh, just to mention to people listening in uh, one of the resources that we are uh, that we are working on creating uh, is a, a guidebook of sorts, which will essentially uh, sort of help people, as I said, who are on the fence and thinking about the ODR opportunity, actually understand what it is and help them understand what some of the most pertinent use cases are likely to be. Uh, again, even during the course of today's conversation, we've heard a number of them. 
but to actually flesh those out a little bit more, uh, develop detailed use cases um, that uh, that people can refer to as they're thinking about their own ODI. But, uh, as I said, a number of us as, as partners are working on, uh, which uh, again will be a consultative process. So look forward to uh, hearing from many of you on, on what might be most helpful uh, as part of that guidebook. So, so that's another resource that's, that's coming. Uh, but Desh, I also wanted to ask you about a number of uh, other things within the, the sector that are happening, in particular within the, the judiciary itself. Uh, we heard some some references by Justice Sri Krishna and others uh, on initiatives within the courts. So uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I, I think one of the most exciting uh, opportunities that we are seeing, and we've already seen three use cases uh, very recently. In fact, one as recently as today, where I believe the Delhi High Court is looking at an e lokadalat concept. So pilots for lokadalats, I think, are a very, very exciting opportunity. You've already seen in Chhattisgarh, uh, nearly three and a half thousand matters were heard in a single day across 200 benches. Uh, some of them dealt with as simply as on a WhatsApp phone call. I mean, I mean, we are seeing the widespread use of technology, not just as an enabler, but as an active fourth party for, for lack of a better definition, where the, the use of technology is ensuring that we're getting access to justice through a technology enabled uh, intervention that can give justice to those who need it the most. And I think that aspect of justice delivery through technology and innovation and using the tools that are at our disposal, I think that is what is the most exciting and e-local dalits are a very good example of that. No, that's wonderful. And, and I think one of the things that I uh, take away the, the most from, from today's session, it's been a, a wonderfully stimulating uh, close to three hours now. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I take away is just how uh, ready many of the use cases and the applications seem to be within industry. Uh, a number of uh, which feel like they are absolutely here and now. This is not you know something that, that needs to be uh, thought about for the future or, or where one needs to wait for an en enabling environment to come in. Uh, these feel like opportunities that are really ready right now. Uh, and we've also heard about a number of uh, startups that are out there in the ecosystem willing to assist with that journey as well. So uh, that, that I think is, is for me the biggest takeaway is, is, is this feels like an opportunity that's ready for now uh, and is, is really only waiting for the entrepreneurial energy of industry uh, to actually sort of capitalize on this opportunity. Um, so, yeah. so wonderful, Desh. With, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you for, for your own uh, thoughts on, on sort of how you, you see uh, today's session uh, and maybe to bring this to a close. No, thanks, Bharat. I think, I, think uh, I think the most important component, which you have touched upon uh, just, just a couple of minutes back, was that we need everybody's voice to be heard and everybody needs to stand up and be counted. I think that if everybody is able to share their vision their suggestions and their key takeaways from what ODI can achieve, whether it's within a microsystem, whether it's in a broader overall vision kind of a component, uh, we have to be able to get everybody's voice across to us through whatever, through whatever medium they choose, uh, whether it's as simple as having shared their comments on the WebEx or YouTube links today in that in those chat modules or whether it's written submissions. I think all of us are here to learn, all of us are here to listen, and all of us are here to ensure that ODI is successful in this unique situation, which, I don't have to which, you, which you heard Mr. Uh, Cyril Shroff, Mr. Amit Kapoor, the entire legal panel was talking about this unprecedented opportunity, right? Where February 2020 and August 2020 are almost a world apart. So, so we really have to use this time. We, we need to use this time, given the, given the unique circumstances and what we're expecting to, to happen. And the fact that the judiciary is so supportive, the industry is already looking to make its own uh, inroads into how best to facilitate use cases. And the government, I mean, the government is as, as encouraging and as supporting as, uh, as one could really hope for. So, so I, I think the future is bright and uh, the best is yet to come when it comes to ODR. Wonderful. No, that's that's great. And again, I think uh, a strong sort of a, a call for for people to to contribute through many of the the channels that you've mentioned, um, and uh, which I think is is sort of going to help propel that that journey forward. Um, 
and and uh, I think you you talked about sort of the the committee itself being an open process, but other mechanisms such as the toolkit, but also feedback through this webinar itself. I think many many channels for people to contribute. Uh, so so that's wonderful. And and with that, uh, Desh, again once again over to you if you want to. This event, uh, and and thereby bring us to a close. No, uh, I, I think we're done. Just again, a quick shout out to the ONI teams, the Agami team, and the Niti team. And uh, looking forward to the next one. Thanks, Bharat.